We still have much more to say about holism and holistic thinking. In this episode, we're going to take a look at what holistic thinking actually is. We're going to offer many examples, many from the personal domain, but also some from the collective domain of what happens when you're not thinking holistically. And we're going to try to teach you how to develop it as well. But uh, before we get into that, just a personal note. Uh, <laughs> I'm on a fast right now. I'm doing a 14-day water fast. This is day seven, which means I haven't eaten any food in seven days, which, uh, so <laughs> if I look a little bit uh, thinner in the face, that's why I lost about uh, uh, eight pounds so far from the fast. And uh, it's made me a little bit lightheaded and uh, low energy. I don't have a lot of energy. And so we'll just have to see. I've never, I've never <laughs> recorded one of these episodes um, not having eaten for seven days. And it is, it is challenging. I've gone through a lot of suffering in the last seven days. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Let's, let's just see how it goes. Uh, it might even be better. I don't know. In some ways, my mind is more clear than it usually is when I'm eating. But in other ways, I just have so little energy. And, the, you know, the brain uses up a lot of calories and glucose to do all this thinking, which these episodes are. So... It's a little bit challenging, but let's get through it anyways. All right, so, and, and by the way, if you want more info on my water fast, why I'm doing it, how to do it yourself, and so forth, I'm going to post a nice deep explanation of that on my blog in a few days. So go check that out once it's available, and I won't mention it here. All right, so, also, if you haven't watched part one of this series, go watch part one. If you haven't watched my episode about what are holons go watch that those are necessary all right so let's get let's get going here so here's my question for you to get this ball rolling what does nutrition have to do with theoretical physics you might say nothing it certainly seems that way when you just look at the surface of the situation like, what does nutrition have to do with theoretical physics? Doesn't seem like much. I mean, maybe you can come up with some sort of explanation such as like, well, in the end, the chemicals which are part of the food that you eat, you know, those are made of atoms, and that's what theoretical physics studies. But that's a, it's a very tangential relationship. And see, many theoretical physicists might take this approach. But consider and this is especially true now that I'm going through this fast and I've been experiencing it myself. You see, the food you eat very much affects how your brain and your mind work. And if you're a theoretical physicist and your whole life is all about thinking and using your brain and your mind to develop new theories, make profound new connections, have insights about deep aspects about the structure of the subatomic realm. It's very important what you eat. Because like I've been fasting for the last seven days and it's, it's, it's amazing how differently my mind functions without food in some positive ways and in some negative ways. But if you told the average theoretical physicist that nutrition is very important to science, he might just dismiss you and not take that very seriously. Because the sort of traditional scientific materialist attitude towards science is that, well, but, but Leo, me as the scientist, I am not relevant to the issue of what's true and what's false. And so if my science is good, if my physics and my physical theories are valid, it doesn't matter what I eat. I could eat junk food and the theories would still be true. 
yes, in that limited reductionistic sense, you're right. But the theories that you're able to generate and even the theories that you're able to understand very much depends on your nutrition. So if you're a theoretical physicist or any scientist, I'm, I'm, we just took the theoretical physicist here as an example. It doesn't matter what scientist it is. It could be a biologist. It could be a psychologist. It doesn't matter. Whatever scientist you are, see, when you're being taught how to do scientific method, they teach you all about the method and how to do your lab work and so forth, but nobody teaches you that in order to do high quality science, you got to do good nutrition. You personally, because you see, there's this, this sort of assumption, this dualistic assumption that, well, the science is one thing, and then you as a scientist, that's a separate thing. And in fact, we want to try to extricate ourselves from the science and act as this neutral third person observer. We want to be objective. We want to be neutral. But actually, there is no neutrality when you do this. Because if you're going to separate yourself from science, and you're going to say, well, my personal life doesn't matter, and nutritional is just part of my personal life. But it does matter. Because the quality of your science depends upon it. What your mind is able to understand, how conscious it can be, very much depends on nutrition. which is why some of the most advanced sages and mystics and yogis from the dawn of time have practiced fasting because it has a profound effect on your, on your, on your consciousness, what you eat. And also why the most conscious people also tend to have the highest quality diets. See? In fact, if you're a materialistic scientist and you think that all this mystical schmistical stuff is all just nonsense and fairy tales and wishful thinking and bullshit, the reason you think that is because you don't have direct experiences of having had mystical experiences or meditation, you know, breakthroughs and spiritual insights. But the reason that could be the case is because you eat garbage and you're overweight. And that junk food is clogging up your, your, your whole physiology. Your whole nervous system is affected by that. And it's limiting your ability to be conscious and to recognize and to have these profound experiences. And so, of course, then you just dismiss them as fairy tales and nonsense and superstition. But that's because you're not making a holistic connection. So why are we talking about this? Holism, right? <laughs> you need a, a holistic connection understanding of the situation to see the connection between high quality science and your own personal nutrition. Because you're not going to be able to understand the best science when your nutrition is bad. And of course, it's not just nutrition. It's also exercise. It's also the kind of toxins and medications you put into your body. All of these things have a, an effect on you. And of course, not just that, but many, many other factors that I won't belabor here. You get the point. You see, so this is sort of the essence of what I'm trying to communicate to you about holism is that when you adopt a holistic attitude towards all of life, it's a game changer because many of the problems and obstacles you used to have, you can start to see them from a higher elevation perspective and solutions become available that cannot be resolved at the level that you were thinking about them at, at the sort of reductionistic level. Many of your problems are literally stemming from a lack of holism. But you don't always see it. In fact, often you don't see it. And it needs to be pointed out to you, which is why we're taking this time to point this out to you with ample exam uh, examples and so forth. Because it... it there's sort of a, a shift that I want you to experience in your mind where you start to say, holy shit, holism is extremely important. And people are not talking about it and taking it seriously enough. When we say holism, people can just say like, oh, well, it's some sort of hippie idea of, you know, Mother Earth Gaia sort of thing, or it's some sort of holistic food idea or holistic medicine idea, some sort of alternative medicine idea. But it's not that. Those are just 
little offshoots and branches from the the massive tree trunk of holism that, that I want you to really focus your attention on here, right? Um, when you adopt this holism attitude, you start to see life in a very different way. You start to see all these different situations in a different way. You start to make interconnections between things and you start to see how this domain of life and that domain of life are really connected, but up until now, you've been treating them as, as totally separate and distinct things. And that's why you were not getting the best results here or the best results there or wherever. And now when you're starting to interconnect them, now you start to see how one informs and connects and affects the other one. And then you can wrap your mind around the whole thing. And then you can see, ah, now I see why I was stuck for all these years. Hitting my head against a a glass ceiling, it's because I wasn't interconnecting things that are actually deeply interconnected. But I was treating them as though I can just, you know, compartmentalize this from that, you know, science from nutrition, nutrition from psychological well-being, psychological well-being from my relationships. I, I thought these were all separate things, but it's like, no, they're not separate things. That's the key thing I want you to understand. All right, now let's get into some more examples. So here are some examples. I have a list for you of problems that stem from a lack of holistic thinking. And we're gonna first cover the collective problems of mankind, then we're gonna get into some personal problems that you, you yourself probably have. All right, so obviously the number one thing is the environment and the ecology. If you care about the environment at all, if you care about the planet, <laughs> of course that already assumes that you have a certain degree of holistic thinking. Because people who are completely unholistic they don't care about the environment or the ecology at all. And this leads to all sorts of problems called the tragedy of the commons. The best example of which is just people who litter. Have you ever seen a person who just litters? Like they're, maybe you're, you're watching him, you know, a guy driving down the highway and he just throws like a, you know, a Coke can, an empty Coke can after he's done drinking it, he just throws it out his window, that kind of thing. And sometimes, like, to me, it's baffling. Like, how can somebody do that? And I've actually spent some number of years puzzling over this. Like, what is going on in that person's mind that they're doing that with such reckless abandon? And, of course, uh, in the end, I realized all it is is that it, they're at a lower level of consciousness and spiral dy dynamics development, such that they're probably a stage blue or orange. And at these stages, there is no deep ecological thinking. The ego mind at this level of development doesn't think in terms of ecology. It doesn't think in terms of systems. It doesn't think in terms of what effect am I really having on the world. It's just acting selfishly, blindly, selfishly. So the problems here are numerous. Pollution, in the oceans and the rivers, with plastic, with chemicals, with heavy metals, with oil, um, overfishing is a huge problem uh, when there's a lack of holism because everyone is just rushing to fish as fast as they can, as much as they can, and then that kills the fishery. In some cases, the fish can go completely extinct. We see this happening, for example, in Russia with sturgeon because of the caviar trade and also because of the poverty of the country and the lack of development of the country. Poaching, poaching of animals, poaching elephants for tusks and ivory and animals are poached in, in basically every underdeveloped part of the world, in Indonesia, in Africa, in South America, elsewhere, sometimes these animals are just poached purely for meat because the people there are so poor, they don't, and of course these poachers, they don't have any kind of holistic understanding of what they're doing. Um, and there are many more other ecological problems, of course, climate change, global warming, and yada, yada, yada. You've heard all that stuff. So anyways, um, and I'll, I'll also I'll bring up the example of ecological collapse due to introduction of foreign species to an environment. So this has been a problem in multiple countries 
I believe it's like in Australia, they introduced some sort of frog or some sort of other animals that were not indigenous and then they just took over. Uh, and now they're, um, you know, decimating the local populations of whatever is there. I know they've had this problem in Hawaii as well. Like in Hawaii, I was in Hawaii a few years ago and I saw this, uh, this weird creature running across the road. I asked them, you know, what is that weird creature? And it was actually a weasel. And I'm like, really? The, a weasel? You got weasels here in Hawaii? And they're like, yeah, they were like introduced uh, for an int introduction. And these weasels are actually terrible because they they eat all the eggs. They eat all. And then basically in Hawaii, all the birds, they they don't build their nests up high in the trees. They build them on in like in the ground, close to the ground, because Hawaii was such an isolated ecosystem that and there, there are no there are no serious big natural predators to birds on Hawaii. There's very few, you know, predators on those islands. And so what happens is the birds were just able to build their nests low to the ground. Uh, but now you introduce this weasel and this weasel eats all the eggs. Well, it, it eats all the eggs, then there can't be any more birds. So they have to fight off these weasels. Um, and I mean, examples of this abound all, all around the world. I won't waste time mentioning them all. So see, that's a, a deep, um, a very deep example of what happens when you don't think holistically about an ecological situation, right? See, there, there are these kind of like subtle, subtle aspects to how a system works. Then you, when you don't, when you don't see all the interconnections, you can easily overlook an interconnection thinking that's not important, but actually it is very important. So, I mean, at first glance, you might say, well, how bad is it to have a weasel in Hawaii? Just forget about it. It's like not, not a big deal. But then you realize that these weasels multiply and there are no natural predators big predators of weasels in Hawaii, which there aren't, that means nothing is limiting these weasels. That means there could be millions of weasels. But if there's millions of weasels, then they're eating all the bird eggs. Now all the birds die. And then that leads to other problems. And so the whole thing spirals out of control. And so uh, that's a very good example. Uh, other examples include Western medicine. Pretty much all of Western medicine is deeply, deeply unholistic and problematic. Um, I've personally experienced this <laughs> especially a lot in the last year. Um, as I've talked about on my blog, I've been struggling with some health issues, some digestion issues over the last year. And I've been going to many doctors, seeing various kinds of specialists and so forth. And um, I've been very frustrated with the, with the kind of attention and kind of utter, utter lack of holism that these doctors apply to their patients. Like, I mean, it's almost criminal, really. In the future, you'll be able to sue a doctor for behaving this way, but today it's just standard practice. I go to one doctor, I tell him I have a certain problem. He says, oh, well, that's not my concern. You gotta go to a different doctor. Uh, you gotta go to this specialist. So I say, okay, fine, I'm gonna go to that specialist. And of course, I'm paying for all this as it's happening. So I go to the specialist, pay him even more. And then that specialist says, oh, well, okay, what are your symptoms? I tell my symptoms, he's like, ah, well, that doesn't sound like it's my problem. Go somewhere else. And I'm like, but what do you mean? I got sent here. You're the specialist on this issue. And he's like, yeah, but your symptoms, your three symptoms don't match my list of criteria. Therefore, you don't have a problem within my domain of expertise. And I'm like, no, I definitely have a stomach problem and you're a gastroenterologist. And he says, no, I can't help you. But he takes, still takes my money, of course. Um, and so in this way, we go round and round in circles and nothing gets solved because essentially no doctor, well, there, there, are, there are some holistic doctors, but the majority of doctors in American medicine, uh, they, do, they do not take a holistic approach to your health. They will only look at well, a very narrow uh, band of problems that you have. If it matches their list of symptoms, they might help you. If it doesn't, if it doesn't fit the little narrow confines of the dogma they were taught in medical school, you know, 50 years ago, then uh, they don't even think that it's a serious problem. I actually went to a gastroenterologist, told him all my symptoms. I had serious stomach problems. And uh, he actually uh, suggested that I, I start seeing a therapist, <laughs> like a shrink. Because <laughs> he said, oh, you're just making these problems up. Of course, later, 
I, I took it upon myself to do various kinds of blood work tests and so forth. And eventually I find out that I do have an actual physical problem within my gut. So I don't need to see a psychologist for this. It's just that he he's not thinking holistically about this stuff. See. So because of this, literally thousands of people die because of this, this lack of holistic approach. Because again, when you're treating the human body, the human body is not divided into the heart and the gut and the bones and the teeth. These are not separate things. They're all interconnected. For example, you might have an infection in your tooth, a chronic tooth infection, which then agitates your immune system, causes it to flare up, which then causes your stomach, because your stomach is like 80% 80, 80 of your immune system is in your gut, which then causes problems in your stomach, causes dysbiosis in your stomach, which is you know, overgrowth of bacteria, and then that causes further problems. And see, if you go to a traditional doctor, He's never gonna. He's never gonna look at the whole thing together. He's only gonna. You're gonna. You know. You're gonna go to one doctor who just looks at the heart. One doctor who just looks at the gut. One doctor who just looks at the immune system. And none of them are gonna be communicating with each other properly. So he's never gonna resolve that. And since this is really a dental problem, and see, dentistry is not even considered part of traditional kind of mainstream medicine. It's sort of considered like a a tangent. It's never even occurred to him that maybe you have a tooth problem. Because he only works on the gut. Or the heart. Or the immune system. But not the teeth. But the teeth are part of the immune system. See? Because your body is a... Is a very well-balanced, fine-tuned hold-on. And it needs to be treated as such if you want good health. Remember... In the last episode, we talked about that holism is health. You can't have human health, health of the human body without holism. And that's why many people, millions of people today are sick with all sorts of autoimmune disorders and other things that, uh, that could easily be solved if only the doctors and the whole medical system was much more holistic. In fact, you know, people who have uh, cardiac problems, heart problems due to cl high cholesterol, clogging of arteries, all this sorts of stuff, the majority of these people, we know how to heal them. You can heal them through fasting. You can heal them through uh, plant-based whole foods diets. These are All of these are proven to, to heal these disorders much better than any kind of medicine. Uh, and we can heal them through mostly through changes in their nutrition and their exercise programs. But of course, the majority of cardiologists in America, if you go to them with a heart problem, they're not even going to talk to you about changing your nutrition or exercise or fasting or switching to a vegetarian diet. They're not going to talk about these things at all. And if you ask them, hey, you know, I have a heart problem. Why didn't you tell me that these things are solutions to my heart problem? Why did you write me all this expensive drug prescriptions and stuff that that has all these negative side effects, what will the doctor say? He'll say, well, I'm not a nutritionist. That's the nutritionist's problem. I'm a cardiologist. I don't, I don't worry about nutrition. That's the epitome of, a, of the kind of problems that result from a lack of holism. And because of this, literally thousands of people die. Millions of people die if you take the entire world into account like this. Of course, Big Pharma has a lot of unholistic approaches and thinking. We sort of addressed that in the uh, in the previous episode with some example there. Um, now let's talk about nutrition. Nutrition, now there's a lot of fad diets going around these days. Um, and nutrition is a, is a tricky topic because nutrition also needs to be treated holistically if you want to get health. But a lot of times, nutrition in these diets are not holistic in their approach. And they're not really concerned with the well-being of the body. Instead, they might be concerned with losing fat or uh, gaining muscle or improving your sex drive or 
tasty food recipes or something like being vegan for ethical reasons of you know not harming animals and while that is a laudable ethical consideration by no means am i dismissing the importance of that you have to consider nutrition as a whole because nutrition is not just about any one of those things you see uh, that which causes you to lose fat does not necessarily mean that it's healthy for you long term. And even being a vegetarian or a vegan for ethical reasons, that also doesn't mean it's healthy for you long term. You can be a vegan the way most people are, and you're eating garbage food, potato chips and various kinds of sauces and fake cheeses and these, these sorts of things. and a lot of sugar. I mean, it's all vegan. Sugar is vegan. You can eat a pound of sugar. It's vegan. But, I mean, is that healthy for you? So, you see, a lot of times people get stuck debating the minutia of these various diets. They get tribal about it, but they don't consider the bigger picture. And, of course, the bigger picture of diet is not merely your own health. You might be saying, as a vegan, you might be saying, Leo, but my own health is not the only factor. There's also the health and suffering of all the animals and the environment and all this, and you're right. That's an important consideration. So not only are we talking about, when we're talking about nutrition, what's good for my personal health, but also we got to take into consider the larger whole on of the society, of also of animals and other species, what effect we have on them, and also stuff like global warming, because the farming of these animals contributes to that significantly. And we got to consider things like overfishing that comes from eating a bunch of fish. and um, you know, soil depletion, the cutting down of the Amazon rainforest for growing cash crops, uh, like soybeans and things. Like, yeah, it's extremely complicated. And, you know, who has time to think about all that stuff? Most of us are selfish. We just want to have the food we want to have. <laughs> and we don't get too fat. Um, yeah, so you got to consider all of these things. And it's tricky. But see, the problem is that if you're going to be vegan, even when it's hurting your health, it's tricky because like you might say, well, the, the, the well-being and, and non-suffering of animals is more important than my own health. Okay, fine. You can take that attitude. But then what happens when your health gets so deteriorated, let's say, and I'm, I'm not saying this happens to all vegans. I mean, this is a kind of a rare example, but, but let's say you're, you're very ideological about your veganism, but actually your health is deteriorating worse and worse and worse every year because you keep you know, insisting on that. And then eventually you get some sort of disease or maybe you even die. Uh, is that really a net positive for the world? Or could you have actually accomplished more in the world by, you know, ethically eating some animal products and things? Maybe you could, maybe you could, I don't know. You gotta, it's a, again, it's all about balance, right? I'm not telling you what the exact thing is that's correct or what you should do. Rather, I'm trying to show you how important it is to think holistically about these things and to take all these factors into consideration. Also, as part of nutrition, I see that a lot of these various diets, they will sort of reduce nutrition down to either calories or carbs or protein or fat, as though that's all there is to nutrition, as though all carbs are the same, as though all fats are the same, as though all proteins are the same, as though all calories are the same. But of course they're not. And there's a lot more to the chemicals that are coming into your body through food than just calories, carbs, proteins, and fat. There's all sorts of pigments and antioxidants that come from, from various fruits and vegetables, from the, the color pigments in those plants. There's all sorts of other, you know, there's, there's many different forms of fat. Some of them are better than others. Um... There's different kinds of carbs. Not all carbs are the same. You have starchy carbs. You have raw sugar type of stuff. You have corn syrup. Uh, but then you have more healthy forms of carbs. So, and, and then and just beyond these categories, there are just even things that probably haven't even been discovered yet that are affecting your health. And so when you reduce nutrition down to these, if you think that the only thing that matters are the sort of stats that are listed at the on the back of the 
box of potato chips that you're eating on the back of it, you know, it gives you maybe 10 different stats. If you think that that's all that matters to nutrition, I mean, that's also the epitome of a lack of holism. Really, that box, if it was properly done in a very conscious society, that box should be listing. It shouldn't be just a little box. It should be the entire back of the, you know, of the, of the, of the box. And it should list like a hundred different chemicals and all their effects and their quantities and how it might affect your body. And not even that, but they should even list like, depending on your age, they might affect you differently. Carbs and fat and protein and calories don't affect someone at age 15 the same way they affect somebody at age 70. And they don't affect women the same as they affect men. And maybe they don't affect white people the same as they affect black people. So, I mean, there's a lot of science and data there that of course would be too complex to list on any box. But sort of in a hypothetical example, you can see that, that how much, how much more precise it would be to, to list all that data. And, uh, and then how much more informed decisions you could make as a consumer of these, of these products. See, but we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, many restaurants still don't even list the ingredients or the, you know, the calories that of the meals that they serve, let alone the percentages of carbs, protein, fat, and a bunch of other things. It'll take us decades just to get to the point where we mandate that every restaurant menu lists at least protein, carbs, and fat, and maybe even the sources of where these items came from, how they were sourced. That's another huge issue. You see, most of us don't know, like, were these, were these, did these eggs come from a factory farm or did they come from a grass, you know, fed pasture farm? That's not told to you in a restaurant. Of course, all restaurant eggs come from factory farms because they're all interested in the cheapest eggs. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it would be nice to know these things. And in general, not just about food, but just about anything. Like it would be nice to see, for example, when you buy some, some running shoes at the athletic store, it would be nice if on the bottom of the shoes or somewhere on the box, it told you all the materials, the plastics and rubbers that were used, where they were all sourced from, uh, whether it's fair trade or not, and, and so forth, to help you to make better decisions. Well, maybe that'll happen in 100 years, but we're not there yet. Okay, another example is with capitalism and business. So in general, the very general critique I have of business and, and capitalism, especially as it is in America, but all around the world, of course, um, also, is that in general, the way business is conducted today, it ignores so many important and huge domains and aspects of human life. It ignores art, it ignores spirituality, it ignores the environment, it ignores health, it ignores social well-being and cohesiveness. It ignores the, the health of the society and it ignores the health of humanity at large. It also ignores the impact that, that, that this has on, on your epistemology and on your worldview. So what do I mean by it ignores these things? Well, I'm not saying that business doesn't participate in these fields. It does. Business participates, business has its tentacles in every field. Business has its, is, participates in art and spirituality, environment, health, and society and humanity. Business participates in all this stuff. The problem though is that the way it participates is that it's just looking to extract money from these things. It doesn't actually care about these things for their own sake. Uh, to most business people, when you start talking to them about the value of art, they'll laugh at you because to them, the art is merely a means for earning money. So even if they entertain your ideas about art, it's only going to be to the extent that they think they can get money out of it. Like if you go to Hollywood and you want to direct some very artistic, beautiful movie that will have spiritual, you know, that will uplift people's souls and their spirits and will 
will get them interested in spirituality, and it'll also talk about the environment and human health. You tell them how important all these things are, and about also about raising social consciousness. You tell this to some of the you know studio executives uh, and business people, and they'll laugh at you. And the only way they will listen to you or take you seriously is if you can tell them somehow how all of this will actually lead them to earning a bunch of money. Then they'll take you seriously. But only to the extent that it earns money. As soon as it's not earning the money, they'll laugh at all your stupid stuff because they don't really care about what you're teaching, what effect you're having on human souls and the society and the environment. They don't care about any of that shit. They just care about their money. And if they can get there through art, they'll do it. But they don't actually care about art. And so this has produced business, which is very soulless. The spirit of business has been ripped away from it. Because really, if you were going to be doing business properly, you would care about these things. And you actually prioritize these things above business. For example, the work that I do with Actualize.org, I prioritize the impact that I have on people. Elevating people's conscience way above the business aspects of Actualize.org. And much to my detriment. Because if I wanted to, I could focus the majority of my resources and time just on the business and marketing aspects of, of Actualize.org. And if I did that, I would be 10 times more successful. I'd have 10 times more viewers. I would sell 10 times more courses and make 10 times more money and be 10 times more popular. And more people would kiss my ass and more people would love me and I'd have more status, and I'd get more invitations to interviews, and I'd be more visible on TV and all this sorts of stuff. And so I've had to make a conscious decision that that's, I don't want to do that. Because I want to put the majority of my attention on the actual content of this work. And that is very much missing in the business world which was why I left the corporate business world. I was in it for a while, and it was so disgusting and soulless to me that I don't want to be part of that at all. And the reality is that it's very difficult to actually do that within the corporate structure. It's not just that there are some elite CEOs that are preventing you from doing that. It's the entire corporate structure is this way. It's very, very unhealthy and dysfunctional, and it creates diseases within our society, many, many different diseases within our society. And so for me, the most important thing when I realized how dirty the corporate world was and how little it appreciated art and spirituality and health and these sorts of things, uh, I, I had to leave the corporate world. It was difficult to do that. And I, I knew that I had to build up my own independent way of making a living and doing business. And that's what I, that's what I did. For example, I was a, I was a game developer worked at a, at a really great studio designing video games. Um, but one of the things that bothered me so much about game development is that even though I loved game development, uh, there were many things that, that bothered me, but I'm just going to focus on this one narrow thing, which is that how unhealthy game development is. The crunch, the overtime, the, the, the kind of garbage food that they eat. For example, every, uh, every Thursday we would have like this game night and they would deliver all this pizza to the office. You play games, and <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this probably sounds so obnoxious to some of you <laughs> who wish you got that at your work. Yeah, but like, I mean, um, so we everybody in the office would be eating pizza. There was no healthy food. All the, there was like a pantry in the office that was stocked with the most unhealthiest, unhealthiest of foods, snacks and Snicker bars and all those sorts of shit sodas. And everybody was just consuming this stuff and then working overtime and just killing themselves making this game. And I mean. Um, that's also the epitome of a lack of holism because many of these, those people, I mean, I left, I left within a year because I, I couldn't tolerate that. Um, but many of those people, they will get cancer. They will get autoimmune disease. They will get all sorts of other problems. They will burn out. All sorts of other stuff is going to happen to them. And they don't see that because they're just myopically focused on developing the next game. And then when you bring this up to the boss, what does he tell you? Like, I brought up the idea of, of crunch. Like, well, can we do something about not doing crunch? He tells you something like, well, it's just the industry standard. That's what, we, that's what we do. That's how we make games. 
Without this, we couldn't make a game. It's just part of the culture. You see, it's so part of the culture that nobody even cares to consider it wrong or, or to change it. And now I'm not arguing that it's difficult to change that. It is very difficult to change that, but it's a very unholistic way of doing business. And that's just only one element. There, there are many other critiques I could have of the game industry. So I won't, I won't go into that here. Of course, um, uh, the next point is closely associated to business is marketing. Marketing, as it is done right now, is extremely unhealthy, extremely toxic. It ignores societal well-being. It ignores the psychological ecosystem of human minds that it infects and corrupts with the mind viruses that it feeds. Um, I mean, I, personally, I think that one of the greatest scandals of the last 50 years is the toxic effect that marketing has had on human minds. And this is a scandal that nobody even talks about or even thinks about or understands at all how significant this is. You're being brainwashed constantly by ads all over the internet, on TV, in the movies, anywhere you go driving down the road and it's infecting you and you're, it, it's shaping your desires and your tastes and your aversions and fears and your whole worldview is being shaped by this as you're growing up, you know, since, since you're a baby. It's been shaping you. And it's only getting worse now that our kids, you know, the, the new generation of Zoomers, they are, uh, you know, using computers even earlier, watching TV even earlier and all this sorts of stuff. And they're all, they're, I mean, like their whole worldview and paradigm is being, is being corrupted by the marketing system. And these marketers, they don't give a shit. They act as though nothing is wrong. It's like, Leo, what's wrong with me pitching my, uh, you know, my, my latest soft drink? You know, what's wrong with me advertising fast food on TV? What's wrong with me advertising cigarettes? What's wrong with me advertising erection medication? Well, what's wrong is that it, all of that combined together leads to that situation we talked about in episode one, where, you know, you shit in the pool, everybody else shits in the pool, soon enough, we're all swimming in a pool of shit. And that's exactly what's happening. But it's, see, it's it's so, it's so subtle because uh, marketing is not a tangible thing. When there's a war going on and children are being bombed, well, that, that's very visceral, we see that. At the immigration, you know, centers when children are being locked up in cages, we see that, we feel that it's a material thing, we react to it. If there's a holocaust, we react to that, you know, uh, very emotionally and so forth. But when our minds are being fed every day by this, by this advertising, it's hard to even point your finger at what the problem is. You don't see it. You're like a fish in water. And of course, the advertisers and marketers themselves are part of this ecosystem, so they're not immune. It's not like they're sitting above the system, you know, shitting down below. They're, they're swimming in the same pool as all of us are. And so their children are also getting infected. No matter how much money you make through your marketing schemes, if you have children, well, your children are gonna go, grow up watching TV and looking at the same ads that you helped create, and then they're gonna get infected by that. And then, of course, whatever ads you create, somebody else is going to create even more toxic ones to outcompete you. And then your children will watch those. That's going to corrupt their, their minds and their entire relationship to life. See? So, especially when we're talking about the health of society as a whole, we need to be extremely holistic to take all of these factors into account and to find the proper balances. How about in geopolitics? A lack of holism in geopolitics leads to something like the Iraq War. Not the first one, but the second one. Uh, so, with Bush and Cheney bumbling their way into the Middle East, thinking that they would be greeted with, with, with roses and bouquets of flowers, and, uh, and that they would be able to establish a democracy there, it just shows a complete lack of holistic understanding of all the subtle, complex, moving parts of the region, the, 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 the developmental level and the consciousness of the region, how they would react, how many lives would be lost, how much money would be spent, 
And ultimately, for what? What did it accomplish? Uh, whereas if, if, if we had a president like Al Gore, maybe, who's a more holistic thinker than somebody like Bush or Cheney, then you, you would have avoided that situation because he would have looked at that situation. He would have said, I mean, maybe there's a reason to go in there. But also, if we look at all the factors, it's going to be a quagmire. It's not worth it. And there are many examples like this in geopolitics. Most of geopolitics is deeply unholistic. And that's why we get war. In a sense, that, that's what war is. War is just a lack of holism. Because if you holistically understood the situation as, as the ultimate supreme leader, as the commander-in-chief, if you understood the situation holistically, you wouldn't go to war. Because you would see how ugly war is, and you would look for other ways. Uh, especially when you're not being directly attacked. Like, I understand, you know, if, if there was a direct attack, then you ha you'd have to defend yourself. But 9-11 was not a direct attack. It was just a terrorist attack. It was not a, it was not a, it was not a state attack on America. And it wasn't even done by that part of, the, by that country. So it, I mean, there, there's so many problems with the Iraq war. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, let's move on to some problems in science. So within science, we have a, a deep problem I've talked about many time, times in the past where science ignores metaphysics and epistemology and dismiss these as unnecessary to the work of science. This is extremely ignorant and extremely unholistic. The scientist sort of assumes that, oh, well, we can just keep doing science as, as we've always been doing it. We don't need to question our deepest assumptions. The epistemology, the metaphysics, that's not going to change the way that I do science. But of course, it will, because the way that you do science, the scientific method itself, hinges upon an implicit metaphysics and epistemology that you have, which for most scientists today is materialism. But this materialism is just taken as the default position. It's not even taken as a metaphysics or an epistemology. It's just taken as truth. Of course, it isn't. It's actually falsehood. Uh, but the way our education system trained scientists, they don't know any better. And when you try to retrain them and open their minds, they say, metaphysics and epistemology is a waste of my time. Well, with that attitude, you're going to keep doing your materialistic reductionistic science and you're going to keep getting um, confused as to why your science isn't progressing and why certain problems can't be resolved. For example, the mind-body problem is easily resolved. We've resolved it. Those of us who've gone beyond materialism, we've resolved it. But to academic scientists, the mind-body problem is still very, very mysterious and very thorny. And they keep waiting for, when will we resolve this problem? Well, you can't resolve this problem through science. You can only resolve it through metaphysics and epistemology and spirituality. Speaking of which, that's another problem that science has, is that science ignores consciousness and spirituality, dismissing these things as unscientific and unworthy of scientific study, or unexplainable by science. Of course, that's untrue. Um, you can have perfect understanding of what consciousness is. Um, but, but most scientists are clueless to that, because they're not holistic enough. They think that science is one thing and spirituality is another thing. They think that matter is one thing and consciousness is something else. It doesn't occur to them that matter and consciousness could actually be the same thing. Another problem within science is that many of the best epistemic lessons and metaphysical lessons that were discovered 100 years ago in quantum mechanics, science understands some of these, but they're not generalized out to other domains enough. Stuff like entanglement, subject-object duality, superposition, and many other weird aspects of quantum mechanics. Most scientists, when you tell them, but let's generalize this out to other aspects of life, like to the macro domains, they say, no, 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 that's not, that's not real science. That's not, you're not, you're not being strict enough. You're being some hippie, uh, you know, dippy, uh, Deepak Chopra person who's just bullshitting stuff. And, uh, and using science to try to rationalize the spirituality or whatever. Uh, but that's not strict science. 
But you see, that is actually the bigger mistake is to take that approach. Because yes, there were very narrow, specific discoveries within quantum mechanics, but that does not mean it doesn't generalize to other domains. But the scientist doesn't have enough holistic understanding to see how a generalization could happen or why it would even be important. They just try to like stick, st stick to the strict science. They tend to be very conservative, these scientists. But actually, in being so conservative, they fail to generalize it out and draw connections and lessons with other aspects and domains of life, which would be very important and illuminating. Another example would be from mathematics. A similar problem is Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which I've talked about in my older episode called The Metaphysical Implications of Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem. Um, mathematicians understand the theorem. They understand the implications it has for mathematics and maybe logic, formal logic. But then when you try to generalize it out beyond that to other domains, which I did in that episode, that whole episode was me generalizing out to other domains implications from Google's incompleteness theorem. When you try to do that with a mathematician or a scientist, they will not even want to listen to you because th their rebuttal will be that, no, 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 Google's incompleteness theorem only applies to uh, certain very specific, narrowly defined logical systems. And anything beyond that, like human language and other stuff, it doesn't apply to that. I've read entire books of mathematicians arguing this. But this is horseshit because the problem is that if you want to be very narrow about its implications, you can be. But that doesn't mean that just because you want to be narrow about them, that they themselves are not further generalizable. They are. Uh, which... If you want to know more about that, go check out that episode. Um, in fact, after Gödel came Tarski, and Tarski developed more general theorems than even Gödel that have even more broader applications. And many, for example, logicians and mathematicians and scientists, when they dismiss what I have to say about Gödel's incompleteness theorem and its generalizations, they they just leave out Tarski, for example, as though he doesn't even exist. And you can generalize it out even beyond Tarski. But the thing is that the more you generalize it out, now the more disconnected it becomes with formal logic and formal mathematics and formal science. And that's right. That's the whole point. But the problem is that these mathematicians and scientists and logicians, they are so locked into the little bubble that they don't care about anything beyond their formalized logic or their formalized subdomain. And of course, when that's your attitude, then you won't be able to draw the interconnections and the, you won't be able to generalize it out further to other domains. So it takes someone like me to come along and who has a very holistic you know, understanding of things or at least a desire to, uh, to understand things holistically, who's not loyal to a, a logic or to science or to mathematics or to anything. Only someone with that kind of attitude can actually be able to generalize it out. The problem though is that when you do that, the people in their little established bubbles, they don't accept you and they think you're nuts. Well, I'll leave it to you to decide uh, who's right on that topic, me or them. The next point is psychology. Psychology is deeply unholistic, reductionistic, and dysfunctional in its current state because it ignores spirituality and non-duality. It also ignores philosophy. It ignores the importance of metaphysical and epistemic and existential considerations when treating patients. That's why therapists, you know, doing talk therapy, psychoanalysis, this sort of stuff, they tend to have very poor results with curing patients. And the reason that is because their patients usually have a deeper problem at the spiritual existential level, at the epistemic metaphysical level. And most psychologists are not trained for that stuff. In fact, they might consider those things to be nonsense and not genuine science, not real medicine. And so as a result, the therapist, the psychiatrist, the psychologist, he ends up having an understanding of human psychology and human behavior at, the, at a very surface level because you cannot understand human behavior without deep spiritual work yourself personally. 
because all human behavior stems from ego. And ego is not just a psychological thing, it's a deeply existential metaphysical thing. So you can't cure someone with a serious psychological issue unless you're able to understand human psychology to, to its bone. And you can't understand human psychology to its bone unless you understand the ego. And you can't understand the ego unless you do spiritual work. So if you're a psychologist or a therapist or a psychiatrist who's not doing spiritual work, you're, uh, you're basically a hack. You're negligent at your work. And your patients suffer for it. Some of them kill themselves because you weren't able to help them. See? And of course, you yourself <laughs> are, are psychologically sick. Because you can't be psychologically healthy without understanding those things. So, uh, yeah, and, and university doesn't teach these things. University only teaches a very narrow version of psychology that ignores all these other factors. In fact, speaking of psychology, about 70 years ago, there was a famous psychologist whose name was Skinner. He developed the Skinner box. Maybe you heard of him. Um, and his, his whole attitude and worldview towards psychology was called behaviorism. His idea was that the internal moods and feelings and attitudes and beliefs of living beings, humans and animals, didn't matter at all. We can just treat the animal or the human as a black box. There's some inputs and there's some outputs. The inputs are the stimuli, like you, you shock an animal with a cattle prod, you know, electrocute the animal, and then there's some sort of response. The animal screams, the animal runs away, the animal you know, opens its eyes, sticks its tongue out, <laughs> whatever. And so he said his whole approach to science and psychology was that we don't care about anything that's going on on the inside. We don't care about consciousness, none of that stuff. We don't care about how it feels. All we care about is inputs and outputs. And all that science and psychology is as a field is the measuring of inputs and outputs such that like you can give a piece of cheese to a rat that's the input and then the rat uh you know eats it and then it uh, you know it jumps up and down and that's the output and that's literally all that reality is that's all that science is uh well by <laughs> by today of course the the absurdity of this gross reductionism is very obvious even to many scientists and psycho psychologists and academics. Um, but even though the absurdity of that reductionism is so obvious, it's so limited, it's so extremely limited, um, this sort of reductionism is still happening all throughout academia and all throughout science in more subtle ways. A similar sort of reductionism was attempted within the field of logic and mathematics during the early 1900s. And this movement was called logicism. It was spearheaded by uh, Gottlieb Frege and um, people like Bertrand Russell, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, and Hilbert uh, and, and others. You know, it was called like Hilbert's project. <laughs> Hilbert's project was to take all of mathematics and to formalize it into a simple algorithm such that every single mathematical truth and proof could be, could be just churned out by a, by a calculator. That was the project. It was the idea that mathematics is nothing more than uh, the logic behind it and the shuffling of symbols, s logical symbols in a formalized sort of way. They try to reduce all of mathematical truth to that, and they utterly failed, miserably failed. And then it took them about 30, 30 years or so to ultimately realize that this is utterly impossible. And it was actually Gödel's incompleteness theorem that, that finally put the nail in the coffin of that. Also, Russell's, uh, Russell's paradox was also central to that. So uh, Gottlieb Frege wrote this, whole, wrote this whole book about how he was able to boil all of mathematics down to logic he wrote this book, he was very proud. He was just about to publish it. Um, he has some like brilliant proofs in there for, for his logic. It was all perfect. 
you know, he's reduced it all down, reductionism. And then uh, right before he publishes it, um, <laughs> Bertrand Russell um, sends him a letter, a uh, short letter that, <laughs> that contains Russell's paradox. I won't go into it here. It's kind of technical. You can go read about it on Wikipedia. But uh, yeah, he just, he, he gave this to, to Gottlieb Frege, Russell's Paradox. And then when Frege read this, his, his whole life's work just collapsed instantly. He spent his whole life developing the system. It all collapsed <laughs> simply because he didn't consider the paradoxical nature of consciousness and of uh, symbolic understanding. There was a similar movement around that time called the Vienna School, uh, and it was called logical positivism. It was this idea that all of science can also just simply be boiled down to simple statements about true or false statements about the nature of reality. Like, is the sky blue? True or false? Is the sun hot? True or false? Is the snow white? True or false? And then that, that's all that science was. <laughs> that's all that reality was. That's all that truth was. Um, and of course it took them, I don't know, 30 or so years to realize that that doesn't work either. And so today, logical positivism of course, is of course dismissed by serious academics and scientists because of, because it's so ridiculously reductionistic, uh, and, uh, and ultimately self-contradictory and false. But, uh, but at some point, some of the greatest philosophers in the world believed in this. So what does all of this have to do with holism? Well, I'm talking about the history of Western intellectual tradition and how deeply reductionistic it used to be and how badly that failed because reductionism fails. That's the whole problem of reductionism. It keeps failing. And the reason it keeps failing is because <laughs> reality is a unity. <laughs> if it's a unity, you can only understand it as a whole not as bits and pieces. And even though I'm saying these things and serious scientists and academics and philosophers might understand everything I'm saying here, this is some technical stuff. Um, most people, most laymen don't, don't know any of these problems, uh, but, uh, but they, they still don't understand the depth of the problem. What I'm saying is that these problems still persist within modern science. This is not some sort of ancient stuff of idiots of the past century. This is go, all going on still today within science. Another example of which is how science ignores psychedelics. Treating it as though it's an unscientific thing. As though psychedelics cannot be used to do much better science. And I don't just mean that science is not interested in studying psychedelics. There are more and more researchers and chemists and even psychologists who are studying psychedelics scientifically, but they're still doing it from a distance. They're not doing it personally. Uh, the real breakthrough will be when serious scientists start taking psychedelics themselves and using that to see the limitations of science. Now that will be true holism right there, but we're a long way from that. Um, within technology, we have a problem. In the technology field, a lot of ethics are ignored. A lot of technologies are just invented for the sake of inventing them for business purposes. So technology and business are closely related. But then uh, the actual ethics of the technology are not taken seriously enough because that would require more holism than these people are trained to practice or care to know or is convenient for business to see. It's much harder to do business holistically than unholistically. You can make a lot more money unholistically. Uh, another example is Einstein's relativity. So Einstein first developed the theory of special relativity, which was a very narrow application of relativity to, uh, I believe it was just velocity in the same sort of direction. So if you have like on one plane, you have uh, one train moving this way and another train moving this way at the same, in the same direction at, the, at, at different velocities, then you could calculate the relativistic differences and so forth. But that was just a very special case. After Einstein developed that, he wasn't fully happy. Einstein said to himself something like, well, 
yes, it, it's great. It's a great breakthrough for this narrow case, but I mean, all of reality is much bigger than this narrow case. What about cases when things are moving at different angles? What about cases when there's also acceleration? Because in his special relativity, I believe acceleration was assumed to be zero. We were just dealing with velocities, but then there's accelerations. What about rotational forces? What about the orbiting, you know, of, of planets and, you know, the complex stuff of which our universe is actually made? What about that? So he had an intuition that actually relativity needs to apply to those things as well, but he didn't know how to do it. Uh, he didn't know the mathematics and so forth. And so it took him some number of years, five or 10 years to figure that out, have some breakthroughs. And then he came out with his general relativity, which is the theory that he's now best known for. That became his sort of life's work. And general relativity expanded that out. So this is what I mean by generalizing out. It, it generalized that narrow discovery to something much larger, which is all moving objects. And the, in general relativity is where Einstein came up with this idea of uh, space time. And that really gravity was just the mass exerting a distortion within space time and you know, it's four dimensional space, blah, 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 complex stuff. So, um, so he generalized it out. But see, we can't stop there. <laughs> really, if, if Einstein was truly holistic in his thinking, he would say, wait a minute, why can't we generalize relativity even more? Why is it only applying to physics? What if we apply relativity, the concept of relativity, to everything in the universe, including the human mind, including science, including religion, including different cultures? including the actual physical existence of objects, including the physical existence of the entire universe. What if all of that was relative? And this would be what I call absolute relativity, which is what awakening is. So see, if he was a little bit wiser and more holistic, he would, he would have awoken, but he didn't because he was still stuck within the little domain of, of physics. And he had to break through that, but he didn't because he considered himself a physicist. And so that's that. But see, today, if I try to teach scientists absolute relativity, they're gonna look at me like I'm crazy because they're gonna say, well, Leo, absolute relativity, you're talking about all these things like science and religion. This is not within the domain of the little work that I do. That's right. I'm talking about the entire fucking universe. So of course it's, it's way beyond the little work that you do in your little cubicle in your university in your little de you know, department, whatever department you're a part of. Even if you're a philosopher, it's way beyond your philosophy department. Even if you're in the religious studies department, it's way beyond your religious studies department because we're talking about the entire universe. So much for that. If you want to understand more about relativity and how that works, check out my very important episode called Understanding Relativism. Part one, I'm also still planning to release part two. Hang in there for that one. Okay, how about education? Education is so ridiculously unholistic today. And this is also creating all sorts of social problems. Perhaps this is the biggest source of our social problems is our shitty education system. So look at all the stuff education ignores. Education ignores personal development, emotional intelligence, love, epistemology, metaphysics, spirituality, nutrition, health, by and large, education does not teach these things. You can go through 12 years, 20 years of education through our, you know, all the way through university and you could not learn anything about these things, leading you to believe that these things don't even exist or that if they do exist, they're unimportant because otherwise they would have taught me, right? I have a very deep critique about the education system and I also have a giant list of how to reform the education system. That's gonna be a, a long separate episode about how to reform our education system and all of its problems. So I, I won't belabor that point here. Uh, there's, there's just so much to say about how deeply fundamentally flawed our education system is. Really what our education system should be focused on is everything that I teach with actualize.org. <laughs> Now you might say, Leo, you're just being self-biased here, aren't you? I mean, how convenient of you to say that our education system should just be what you teach. But uh, you have to understand how I came here. 
I came here because I had a very holistic attitude towards life and I was re researching all this stuff and I wanted to know, you know, what's the deepest, most important lessons that you can learn in life? And through that, actualize.org spawned rather organically. Um, and so, and also I didn't like invent these things. I mean, these things have existed long before me. <laughs> Mankind has been teaching this stuff for 10,000 years. Uh, it's just that they're not incorporated properly into our education system. Uh, so it, it actually truly is the case that our education system should be teaching you everything that I'm teaching. Really, if the education system was properly designed, I would be out of a job. But of course, the other way you can see that is that this is the education system. This is the new education system. I am building the new education system. That's what actualize already is. It's the education system that there should be, but there isn't because of all the systemic gridlock and problems and red tape that exists within our education system. See, I wouldn't be able to teach these things within the education system. You might say, Leo, why don't you just become a, a high school professor uh, or a high school teacher? Or why don't you become a university professor? And I thought about that when I was younger. I actually wanted to be a professor of philosophy at a major university. And then I realized that I can't because the system won't let me teach the things that I really want to teach. And therefore, I knew I had to carve my own path. And so that's what I did. And so here we are. And so even though, of course, Actualize.org, the trade-off is that Actualize.org doesn't have the same reach. It can't reach hundreds of millions of people uh, the way that our education system can. But... Uh, but the but the upside is that we can really talk about advanced things to those people who really care about them. And then what's going to happen is that over the next hundred years, our current education system is going to incorporate, it's going to realize its errors, and it's going to start to incorporate all the stuff that I've been teaching. And of course, it's not just me. There's many people who teach advanced stuff like what I'm teaching. So I'm not I'm not saying this egotistically as though like my my work is the only work. It's like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to pull from. And in fact, my work pulls from hundreds of other people's work, which you can see if you read some of the books on my book list. Um, but anyways, so this is a lack of holism within education. Scientific studies in general. I often see people quoting scientific studies as though they're the truth. The problem with scientific studies is that they're extremely narrow. And uh, they're unholistic in the way they design these studies. Therefore, they give you very narrow results. And when they give you these narrow results, these results can be so narrow, they're so easily recontextualizable in the future by other data and other studies that it's almost worthless to actually base any kind of actions or behaviors on them. Which is why a lot of these nutritional studies and so forth, they're so flimsy. People tout them as they're like, oh, this study came out that says that coffee makes you live longer or red wine makes you live longer or something like that or saturated fats are good for you or bad for you or whatever it is. And I just look at these and I say, I you can't, you, why are you taking any of these studies seriously? They're so limited in their scope when you're, what you're talking about is this holistic, highly complex human organism and you have this very narrow study about red wine or coffee or carbs or whatever. It tells you virtually nothing. In fact, it's misinforming you. It's filling your mind with all sorts of simplistic reductionistic delusions that will actually end up harming your health more than it'll probably help you. All right, so that's the collective problems. Now let's talk about the individual problems, stuff that you face. So individual problems stemming from lack of holism include stuff like living a hedonistic lifestyle, eating junk food, for example, when you're eating that junk food, are you holistically thinking about how this affects your longevity, how this affects your health, how this contributes to your ability to do your work, to fulfill your life purpose, to be able to love, to be able to have sex, to be able to raise children? No, you're just you're just picking out on some pizza. Uh, same thing with uh, when you're not exercising. How about staying at a job that pays very well but it doesn't satisfy you. And you keep staying at it and staying at it and staying at it, procrastinating, leaving, and you just keep staying at it for 10 years. You waste 10, 20 years of your life. And then by that point, you're too uh, jaded to even bother to make a change. 
See, if you were holistic in your thinking, you would realize that, yeah, this job pays a lot, but the fact that it doesn't satisfy me and doesn't align with my life purpose at my highest values, this is the bigger problem. This is what needs to really be addressed. And no amount of money is worth that. So let me leave, even though I'm going to take a temporary um, you know, hit to my salary. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult to leave and find a new job or to find start a business or whatever. But it's going to ultimately be more satisfying in the end. And that's what matters the most. See, most people don't think this way about their work. How about crunching at work and leading a, an alcohol, a workaholic lifestyle? A lot of people do this. They work themselves to death until, or until they get a disease or they crunch at work until they burn out and they have to quit or they're so tired they can't do good work anymore. See, crunching and being a workaholic seems nice at first if you're only thinking you know, short term in terms of the next year or two. But if you're thinking in terms of your career and your business and your productive output over your entire lifetime, these things are um, laughably stupid. And yet so many people do them because they're not thinking holistically, right? They're not considering how their work connects with their relationships and their marriage, with their sex life, with their health, with their children, with their relationships with their friends, with their family. All these things are interconnected and you need all those things to be in balance to have a happy life. But when you just focus on the work, you might think that it'll do something for you, but uh, it's probably going to make you more miserable than the opposite. How about the example of avoiding going to the doctor? Have you ever done this? You might think you have some disease or some ailment or something on your whatever growing on you. And then you're like, gosh, I should probably go to the doctor, but I don't want to because... If I go, I'm afraid of what he's going to say. Is it cancer? Is it a, a, you know, is it something nasty? Is it something expensive? Oh, this is going to cost me $10,000. I don't have insurance, whatever. And so you don't go to the doctor and you keep procrastinating for years, not going to the doctor. Well, that's obviously very unholistic and stupid of you. <laughs> it would be much better to just go and get it, get it over with. Because, you know, just by not going to the doctor, that thing's not going to go away by itself. You're just sticking your head in the sand. Uh, how about this example? Starting a project, a work project, but then losing track of the ultimate goal of what the project is about. This is actually extremely common, and it happens even to, to very smart and conscious people. You can get so wrapped up in a project, especially if your project is going to take multiple years to, to complete, that your original intentions behind the project, they were probably noble and pure they slowly get corrupted by the pragmatics of the work that you're doing, you know, the daily grind, to the point where you forget even why you began this kind of work in the first place. And then your goal just becomes something like, uh, rather than some lofty goal, you know, to create some beautiful work of art, or to influence people in a positive way, your goal becomes something much lower and baser, something like, uh, you know, just to pay the bills, or just to, to keep people employed, or just to keep the company running, or just to uh, finish the project or just to keep doing the same stuff that we've been doing. You know, with Actualize.org, I constantly have to look back, at, you know, what were my original intentions for starting this stuff? Because it's easy for me to just get lost in the grind of pumping out more videos every week. That takes up the majority of my, like, mental real estate. Uh, but then I have to wonder, like, wait a minute. Should I even be making videos at all? Maybe there's some higher form of doing my work than videos. Maybe I should write a book. Maybe I should do workshops or retreats. Maybe I should just go live in a cave and meditate. Maybe that's really my work. And so I have to think back to this, like, why am I doing this, right? What, what's the ultimate goal? What is this serving in, in, in the grand scheme of things of my life? What is, how is this serving me releasing these videos? I mean, sure, it gets me some money. It gets me some, you know, some pleasure to release this stuff and to get feedback from you guys and so forth. There's a certain satisfaction to doing work, but ultimately I did not get into this work only for the satisfaction of doing work or for the money or even for the, you know, the positive comments or stuff. I got into it because I wanted to have a very specific impact on the world. And then I have to wonder, like, 
but is actualize.org really having that impact or is there a better way to have that impact? Maybe there's a better way, in which case I have to just maybe quit actualize.org altogether, shut it down, because maybe there's a better way to do it. But see, that requires a very large holism to be able to do that. It's very easy to get stuck in one thing. Another example is uh, being cheap when hiring employees. See, if you lack holism and you try to hire the cheapest employees, you might end up hiring also the worst, le least innovative, most uh, unskilled employees. And then that actually ends up hurting your business. It might even actually lead to the bankruptcy of your business. So maybe it would have been better to, to pay more, but then also to get more. But that requires a long-term sort of holistic understanding of how business works. How about lying in relationships? That's a great example. A lot of people will lie in relationships thinking that, well, if I can just get away with this lie, what's the big deal? But the problem is you get away with it, then the next time you also want to get away with the next one and the next one. And where does it stop? And then your relationship is built upon lies. And then, of course, uh, see, if you're not thinking holistically, you can think that you can get away with that. But if you think holistically, you realize that, you know, if I want a quality, loving relationship, which is probably what I want, then it has to be built on honesty. As soon as there's going to be too many lies between us, that relationship is as good as gone. It's dead and you're never going to bring it back. But an unholistic person is not thinking about the relationship holistically. Uh, most people are thinking about the relationships just flying by the seat of their pants, just navigating, using their pleasures and their aversions. They don't actually think in sort of meta way about the relationship itself and how to sustain the health of the relationship. See? And then people wonder, why do so many people get divorced and why, uh, why are most relationships so toxic and unhealthy? Well, because to have a healthy relationship, you would have to Look at it holistically, not just from your selfish personal needs, not just from what causes you pleasure, not just from what causes you to feel love, but holistically the entire relationship. You don't just look at your own needs or your partner's needs, but you have to almost like as though there's a third entity that is a third whole on that's even larger and more important than either you or her or him, whatever it is. Uh, there's there's a larger sort of third, which is the relationship itself. And how do you maintain the health of that thing as a coordinated dance between the two of these holons that you and she or whatever is? And um, see, that's a very different attitude towards relationship, much more holistic. And notice, by the way, how much selflessness that would require to approach relationships that way, rather than approaching relationships the way most of us do, which is just like, uh, what am I going to get? What kind of sex am I going to get? What kind of love am I going to get? And if I'm not getting it, then I'm pissed off and I'm going to fight with you. Speaking of relationships and sexuality and dating, uh, pickup, the entire pickup community, perhaps its biggest problem is that it's fundamentally ridiculously unholistic. It's all about the male perspective, as though the female perspective isn't even important. And of course, because of this, even though many of these pickup people can get laid, it's effective for getting laid. But when it comes to actually having deep, fulfilling relationships with women, these pickup guys are, are so far away from that, <laughs> being able to do that. And in fact, pickup makes, you, makes it even worse because it, it trains you with this very, very unholistic, deeply self-biased, attitude towards sex, dating, and relationships. I've talked about that to some degree in my <laughs> rant against pickup episode. Check that out. Uh, how about this example of staying married for the sake of children? Sometimes I hear adults do this. Um, but see, the problem is that if you really don't get along with your wife or husband, staying married to them just for the sake of the kids to sort of keep up appearances, um, this is going to backfire on you. You're not thinking holistically. Holistically speaking, I mean, you two, uh, if you can't get along and you plan to live for the next 20 years together anyways, <laughs> for the sake of the kids, I mean, there's going to be so many fights, uh, so much demonization and judgment and hatred and toxicity build up. It's all going to flow to your kids. And then your kids will get programmed with that for the rest of their life. And they'll be traumatized by that. 
You're not going to be able to hide this from the kids. Maybe it would be better for you to separate, you two to separate, but then at least the kids won't have to watch you fighting all the time with each other. That might actually be healthier in the most holistic sense. I mean, I don't know. You have to, you have to figure out the details for yourself. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just proposing this as an example. How about ripping off your customers if you're doing business? It might seem in the short term that ripping off your customers is good. Gets you money. Uh, but in the long term, in the long term, your customers will probably catch on. They will get resentful. Uh, and then you won't have many customers and your business will fail. Another example of lack of holism is dismissing the importance of theory. Some people take this attitude of like, oh, theory is all bullshit, it's philosophy, armchair stuff, not important. Let's just get down to work. Let's be very practical. Sounds good in theory. But in practice, what happens is that when you ignore theory, your practice is very limited. Because theory shows you new ways to practice. Theory allows you to introspect deeply about your practice and to fine tune it. Theory might tell you that your entire practice is useless. You should be doing some other totally different practice. See, how do you know which practice you should be doing? How do you know the practice you're doing is, is the best one? Well, only through theory can you figure that out. See? So, the division between theory and practice is, is a deeply problematic and unholistic duality. I have an older episode called uh, Theory Versus Practice or something along those lines. Search for it, uh, which is actually one of my most important episodes. Very underrated. Go check that out because it, it, uh, so many people are confused about this duality between theory and practice. And they're both important. They're both very important, but they have to be balanced very delicately. Loans and credit. <laughs> That's a super unholistic um uh, economical idea, both at the individual level, also at the collective level. Uh, and perhaps lastly, the most uh, problematic lack of holism is not doing spiritual work. If you think you're just going to skate by in life without doing any spiritual work or any existential considerations, and you think that you're just going to live a good life, well, I got news for you. You won't. You're going to suffer very deeply for this. And in the end, as you get older, you're going to have to start to face your death as you age. And as you face your death, you're going to, you're going to experience the worst suffering because by not doing the spiritual work, you haven't really realized what death is. You haven't come to terms with it. You're still living in your ego. And those last few years or even decade or so of your life are going to be some of the most miserable years. Uh, so... Maybe it's not so wise to not do spiritual work. So holistic thinking can be applied at the individual level and also at the collective level. Both are important. And in fact, you should notice that this duality between the individual level and the collective level is itself a sort of brokenness, a fragmentation within consciousness. So if you approach reality as though these two things are separate, and as though one is important, but the other one is not, that can only lead to disease and brokenness and evil. You should think of the individual and the collective as two strands of that, you know, double helix DNA molecule. You need both strands that are intimately intertwined and perfectly balanced with each other to create the DNA strand. That's... That's in a sense what society is. Society is not just society. It also is in the, the individuals that make it up. And the individuals are not just individuals. They're also the society upon which they rely, without which they couldn't live. So I would like you to contemplate for yourself. Contemplate how many problems in the world are the result of unholistic thinking. And then also contemplate how many of your personal problems or the problems of people you you know are the result of unholistic thinking. And that should get you a good idea of why it's so important. Uh, beware of teachings and endeavors or projects which are not holistic. For example, 
success-based materialistic self-help teachings or business of that same nature or Western medicine or physics or mathematics or philosophical schools or religions or even spiritual schools, cults, and political ideologies. All of these things are deeply unholistic and if you buy into any one of these things too much and you take it as the ultimate truth, it's going to lead to problems, brokenness, disease, and suffering, and ultimately evil. Now, I was driving my car just the other day. I had this whole episode planned out already, and I was just thinking, like, what is the essence of what I'm trying to say here? Why is it that a lack of holism is so problematic? And the thing that popped into my mind, sort of as a eureka moment, is that really what I'm trying to say here is that a lack of holism equals paradigm lock. If you don't know what paradigm lock is, sort of a term I coined, uh, you can find more about that by seeing my episode called How Paradigms Work. But paradigm lock just means you're locked into a paradigm, whether it's the scientific materialistic paradigm or the religious Christian or Muslim paradigm, or the Buddhist paradigm, or, I mean, there, there's many paradigms, the capitalist, socialist paradigm, whatever. So you see, your mind subscribes to this worldview or paradigm, and this paradigm for, sort of forms the periphery of your mind and what reality is for you. And one of the most powerful ways to keep you within a paradigm is by limiting your holistic thinking. Because if you think too holistically, eventually you'll realize that the paradigm is just a little bubble that you're trapped in and you can break out of it. For example, if you're a fundamentalist Christian, almost everything within fundamentalist Christianity is designed to keep you within the bubble. Like if you start asking too many questions, they'll, they'll you know, reprimand you. If you start behaving in ways that don't correspond to the paradigm, they'll reprimand you. If you start reading certain books that they don't like, they'll reprimand you. They'll excommunicate you or whatever. All to kind of force you to stay within the little paradigm. And there's sort of taboo stuff. Everything that's taboo is really the stuff that's considered false or evil. Basically, to keep you in the paradigm, the paradigm creates this notion of evil. And of course, evil is anything, <laughs> self-servingly, because all these paradigms are very selfish, Evil is defined as anything which would break you out of the paradigm. So taking psychedelics is evil because it would break you out of the paradigm. Or, you know, doing meditation is evil from a fundamentalist Christian perspective because it breaks you out of the paradigm. Studying too much science is evil. Maybe going to university is too evil because those are elitists that are trying to brainwash you. They're Marxists and communists, whatever. Reading Karl Marx's works, Das Kapital and whatever, <laughs> um, that's evil. Why? Because it might start to get you to question the whole Christian paradigm. And so, but this is not just Christianity. This is true for Islam, Buddhism. It's true for science as well. See? And so to break out of these paradigms, your po most powerful tool is holism. Because holism gets you to recognize that, well, wait a minute, I'm a Christian, I'm in this bubble, but there's also a Muslim who's probably also in this bubble. There's a Christian, or I mean, a, sorry, an atheist who's also in this bubble. And so, wait a minute, these are all three different bubbles. Is there something beyond that? How do I integrate all of these bubbles into a single understanding? And when you do that, you break out of yours and you don't jump into any others. You go higher. You sort of create a higher bubble that incorporates all those three. And then once you're, you live in that for a while, for a few decades, then you realize, wait a minute, other people are doing the same thing as I am. They're kind of going meta on all their paradigms, but then they do it in different ways. So wait a minute, who's right, me or them? And then you realize, wait a minute, I have to go even higher and you have to create an even higher bubble. And so this continues. And in this way, you end up breaking out of all the paradigms and you end up uh, jailbreaking your mind. I've talked in the past about this idea of jailbreaking the mind. I talked about it especially in 
my episode called what is actualized.org sort of the intro to what we're doing here with this work jailbreaking the mind is what we're doing and to jailbreak the mind you need to be infinitely holistic that's how the mind jails you is by getting you comfortable in a less than a infinitely holistic way of thinking about reality Uh, another point I wanted to make here is about corruption. You know, a lot of people complain about corruption in government and so forth, but they don't really understand how deep the problem of corruption goes. It's not just some elitist Washington fat cats who are corrupt, and it's not just, you know, Bill Gates and other CEOs and Jeff Bezos who are corrupt. Uh, corruption really is a lack of holistic intelligence. That's truly what, what corruption is at its essence. I don't have time here to go into more depth on corruption, but I have a whole deep episode about corruption. So this ties in with that. Go check that out. It's called How Corruption Works. It's a very important episode. One of my best, also sort of underrated. Make sure you watch that because corruption is much more sneaky than you think it is. So here's the catch-22 of holism. You ready? Thinking holistically... <laughs> Thinking holistically requires appreciating the value of holism. Because if you don't appreciate the value of holism, why would you think holistically? But to see the value of holism and appreciate it requires that you're seeing holistically. <laughs> That's the catch-22. So it's difficult. It's difficult for me to convince someone to think holistically when... He doesn't see the value in it, which is why we're spending the bulk of this series talking about all the problems and the value of it. So you can really grok at a deep level how problematic it is to not be infinitely holistic in your understanding of reality. It directly leads to suffering for you and for all of mankind. See? But if you insist on being dense, and not thinking holistically, there's nothing I can do to convince you otherwise. For example, you might, you might pose the objection to me like, but Leo, haven't a bunch of people become rich and wealthy and powerful without thinking holistically? So why can't I just live my life that way? I mean, it seems like you're you're trying to set me on this course of the holistic life. But then there's this other course, which is the unholistic life. Why wouldn't I choose that when I can get billions of dollars and hot girls and uh, fancy cars and a bunch of gold and whatever else? A yacht, buy, buy, buy myself a yacht, a uh, private jet. Why wouldn't I do that? Well, of course you could, but... Can you see that even being attracted to that way of living, the sort of opulent luxury lifestyle, even to be attracted to that, can you see how that already demonstrates a lack of holistic understanding? Because if you truly had a little bit of a holistic understanding, you would see that that lifestyle, even though you're going to get money and girls and yachts and whatever else, jewelry, um, can you see how none of that, that's just going to be a hedonic treadmill. You're going to be running in, you know, in place, thinking you're getting somewhere, but it's not really going to satisfy you. You're still going to be deeply dissatisfied with your life. In fact, maybe even more so, because once you achieve those things, there's not going to be anywhere higher to go. Once you get a yacht and a private jet and you've, you know, you've banged a hundred hot girls and you've got all the jewelry, what's next? Where do you go from that? more of the same thing? Can you see how that's not going to satisfy you? You might even get suicidal from that. So the sooner you realize that, the faster you can just nix this entire path. Because this path leads you straight to hell. This is a path to hell. It also creates a lot of evil in the world. To get your billions and millions and to, to bang a hundred hot girls and to ha have your yacht, a lot of suffering needs to be caused to others. There's a lot of collateral damage that comes with that. So, 
it would be wise of you to, to realize that this path, the holistic path, is actually going to lead to more fulfillment. But that assumes you have some wisdom in you. If you don't have wisdom, I, I can't. I don't know what to say to show you <laughs> the value of this path. The, the ultimate, see, if the ultimate end goal of this path is hell, what do you think the ultimate end path, <laughs> end point of this path is here? Yeah, it's, um, it might seem like I'm being, uh, sort of, like I'm exaggerating, but it, it literally is what you think it is. It's the opposite of hell. But it's not easy to get there. The holistic path is a difficult path. Which is why most people don't take it. But it's also deeply rewarding. And it's not flimsy and shallow like this path. There's real depth and meaning to this path here. Many aspects of life and reality cannot be understood without significant holism. For example, understanding the dynamics between men and women, sexually, within you know, relationships, this cannot be understood unless you're very holistic. Understanding conflict and war, like, for example, do you want to understand why war happens or why conflict happens between people, between nations? You can't understand that without deep holism. Understanding trauma and evil and corruption also cannot happen without deep holism. Understanding how to create a healthy society can't happen uh, without holism. And these are just a few of the examples. There's a lot more. So if you really want to understand things and you value understanding for its own sake the way that I do, personally, I guess that that's, that's the biggest reason that I personally subscribe so much to an attitude of holism, infinite holism, is because m my highest value is that I want to understand as much as possible. That's my biggest payoff in life. It's not money. It's not releasing videos. It's not my work. It's just pure understanding. My own, it's kind of selfish. Just purely understanding things. And so I realized that I can't understand everything that I want to understand unless I'm totally holistic about it. And so that means I got to be holistic. So here we are. <laughs> All right, let's formally sort of define what are the components of holistic thinking. So when we say holistic thinking, what do I really mean? Because it's, it's sort of a, it's a very uh, vague word very vague term. So first of all, it means taking all levels of being into account, the higher and the lower, that you, you care about the ants, you care about the stars, and you care about everything in between, and you take all those into account. It also secondly means taking responsibility for everything. It's a radical responsibility taking, and that's why it's so challenging. For example, a lot of people simply get stuck and don't develop further in their consciousness because they just don't want to handle the responsibility. You know, it's much easier to just, you know, when you're sipping your Coke can, you just throw it out the window. That's so much easier than actually taking responsibility for the fact that this Coke can is going to like actually create some litter and maybe harm some animals or whatever. Um, then, then you got to like, you got to figure out what to do with this Coke can. You got to save it, put it in a bag, take it out to a trash can. When you stop, you got to stop your car. That's much less convenient. And most people simply don't want the inconvenience of taking this much responsibility. But that's what holistic thinking demands. Uh, thirdly, it's uh, awareness of your effect on the whole. So are you aware of how you affect the corporation you work in, the family that you're a part of, the relationship that you're, intimate relationship that you're a part of, of the country that you're a part of, of the globe that your country is a part of? as a living being within the entire universe? Uh, are you aware of the effect that your food has on society or on poor people in another country? Are you aware of how the work that you do might influence other people? You know, are you aware of the toilet paper that you consume, how that has an effect on the rainforest, cutting down trees? Like, all those need to be taken into account. Another aspect is internalizing externalities. Externalities are those things outside of your scope of survival concern that don't concern you. 
And so um, to be a holistic thinking, you start to integrate those externalities. Like when you're driving your car, usually you might not consider how the pollution from your car or the CO2 emissions from your car are affecting to you know global warming or to cancer rates and babies or whatever. You usually don't care about that, but but when you become a holistic thinker, you internalize that externality, this carbon or this, these, this pollution, you internalize it, and then the consequence of internalizing it in your mind is that ne next time when you go to buy a car, you might think twice about the kind of car you want to buy. Maybe you're going to look for a more fuel-efficient car. Maybe you'll buy an electric car. Maybe you'll use a bike instead of a car. See? So it's not just the theory. Theory then, you know, percolates into practice. Another component is that um, holistic thinking accounts for systemic emergent properties. You realize that new things are emerging within reality. So for example, as all of the nations on the planet are getting together more integrated using internet, literally we're wiring the globe. I actually posted a while back on my blog, a time-lapse video of how, you know, cables are being laid, fiber optic cable is being laid through all the oceans of the world interconnecting every city together into a giant internet, you know, almost like a hive mind. As this is happening, you got to realize that new things will emerge. Reality is not just atoms and molecules and humans and nations. New stuff is going to keep emerging as we keep evolving, and you have to keep your eye open for that. It's very easy a lot of times to sort of dismiss the, the new emergent stuff. Like maybe we can almost start to see that there is a, an emerging hive mind of mankind which is coming online right now thanks to the internet and all this sort of stuff. And, and I'm not just saying that we have a bunch of interconnected computer, computers. And I'm not just saying that we have a bunch of humans talking to each other. I'm saying, no, a totally new, we might almost say consciousness is emerging perhaps out of the combination of all those things, in the same way that you, your consciousness is an emergent, we might say, of all the different cells and organs of the body. But those individual cells and organs don't know that you are conscious, we might say. Well, consider that possibility now with mankind as a whole. Pretty cool, huh? Um, another component is that holistic thinking accounts for backfiring mechanisms and the counterintuitives, counterintuitiveness and nonlinearity of uh, reality. What do I mean by this? As I talked about in my Intro to Systems Thinking, which you should go check out, it's related to this topic, um, systems tend to, complex systems that are nonlinear tend to backfire. A lot of times you make a change and the result is the opposite of what you want. And so therefore they're very counterintuitive. So... To be a holistic thinker, you always got to be keeping your eye out for this non, uh, for this counterintuitiveness and also what I call inversions. A system or a dynamic can easily invert on itself and go full circle. Check out my episode called Thing, The Theme of Things Going Full Circle, where we talk a lot about this with many examples. But there's a lot of examples that keep recurring where things go full circle. And they, they boomerang. And then this leads to very surprising counterintuitive results. And so you need to always be looking out for that. Um, another aspect of holistic thinking is it sees how the part fits into the whole. But also it values not just the whole, but also the parts. You got to value the whole and the parts. Otherwise, there's problems. It also, holistic thinking also sees how all dualities must always ultimately reunite. And I've talked about that at, at great length in my episode called Understanding Duality, especially part three, where I unify all these different dualities together. And so you got to be able to see how that keeps happening. For example, when someone tells you, well, there's individual problems, there's collective problems, and they're separate. You, as a holistic thinker, got to be able to see that, no, wait a minute, they can't be separate. They're deeply intertwined, like I said. 
and ultimately they must unite. And ultimately, the difference between the individual and the collective, there can't be a difference. That difference is a relative difference. In the absolute sense, there is no difference. Likewise, when someone says, well, there's men and there's women, and men are better than women, when someone tells you to that, you should, as a whole thing, you're be able to zoom out of that and say, wait a minute, men and women, that's just a duality. They must unite together, and there must not be any difference between men and women at all at the absolute level, only at the relative. Yada, 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 so forth. Holistic thinking requires a long time horizon. That's an important feature. You can't just be thinking one year ahead. You got to be thinking decades ahead, maybe even 100 years ahead, maybe even ahead of your own death to be really holistic. Like with climate change, I mean, climate change is already happening. We're seeing the effects of it. Some people are suffering from it, but the worst parts of it aren't here. And uh, maybe the worst parts won't even be here within your lifetime. So you might just say, well, okay, then fuck it then. Who cares about the environment and, and global warming? It doesn't, it doesn't matter because I'll be dead by then. Well, <laughs> then you're not thinking holistically. And that's the level of development and consciousness that you're at. Holistic thinking requires that you consider relevance, priority, context, and balance. These are very important. You always have to be asking yourself as a holistic thinker, is this thing relevant? How relevant is it? Is this the highest priority? What do we really care about here? Is this thing important? What is the context of this thing that I'm being told that I'm doing? And how do I balance things out? And holistic thinking requires considering the greatest good for all without selfish needs for yourself. So what is the greatest good of all? That's what you want to be aligning your mind and your life to. Now, it's important to note that it's not enough to just be a holistic thinker. You must also, perhaps even more importantly, be a holistic carer. Carer. You must care about holism, not just think it. So here's my question to you. Do you genuinely care about the whole? If you don't, how can you ever be holistic? Are you willing to be selfless for the sake of the whole? See, the problem is that most people are so wrapped up in their personal struggle just to survive, just to pay the bills, just to hold their little toxic relationship together. And their minds are so biased, just fulfilling their basic needs and avoiding immense suffering, that they don't have the mental capacity or resources to care about anything else but themselves and their own survival. If that's you, I'm not blaming you or judging you. I understand that some people just have those situations. In fact, most people do. And I've been there myself, and I still have some of that in me as well. You know, we're all surviving in some degree or another. But, but if you're so wrapped up in survival that you don't have the mental space or the emotional resources to genuinely care about something larger than you, then how can you can't be holistic? So if you're like that and you want to become holistic, the highest leverage thing you can do is to solve your survival challenges. Solve them permanently. Solve them in a healthy way such that you're not repeating the cycle of just surviving. See, the problem is that people, when they try to solve their survival challenges, most of them, the way they solve them is they solve them in very unsustainable ways such that next year they have to do it all over again. And then next year they have to do it all over again. So they're stuck for the rest of their life just, just sort of treading water just to stay afloat. Well, if that's you, you will never be holistic and you will never reach the higher stages of life. You got to find some permanent solutions to that so that you have some free room and space and time to think about something larger than yourself. Now, that does not mean that I'm giving you an excuse to be a selfish asshole and to never think about something larger than yourself. You can start thinking about larger stuff today, even if you're stuck in some job that you hate or you can't pay your bills, you can still think about this stuff. I mean, 
just try to see what you can get away with, what, what your ego will let you get, get away with. But realistically, your ego won't let you get away with too much thinking about others and improving society and so forth until you take care of your basic needs. Take care of your money needs, take care of your food needs, take care of your shelter needs, take care of your uh, sexual needs in healthy ways, sustainable ways, such that then you can move on to something larger. Now, I want to give you an example here of different degrees of holism, because it's important to see that there's degrees of it. So, for example, let's take politics. In a certain philosophical sense, we might ask ourselves, what is politics really about? What's going on? Like, if we, if we totally zoom out of all the crazy political rivalry that's going on in America or in the world, what's really going on? Well, someone who is a very low level of holism might say something like, well, Politics is about fighting off those evil other guys. Like, if I'm a Republican, I'll say politics is really about defeating the Democrats. If I'm a Democrat, I might say politics is all about defeating the Republicans. Or if I'm a Muslim, I might say polit politics is all about spreading Islam and defeating the Christians or whatever, or the secularist infidels. So this kind of is like the lowest level of, of, of understanding what politics is really about. Um, the next higher level of holism would be something like, well, politics is, is really about money, power, fame, sex, and domination. I mean, that's what all these politicians are doing. It's just different factions vying for, for who gets the most money, the most power, the most fame, the most sex, the most domination. There's some truth to that. Every level of this degrees of holism has some truth to it, but it's not a very high level of truth. There's a, there's more distortion than truth in that. But then we go up one more level and we say, well, wait a minute, what's, what's it even more about? What's, the, what's something even higher that we can say that politics is about? Well, it's about creating a better society, you might say. A fairer society. It's about reducing suffering. I mean, isn't that really what society is about? Ultimately, we got together because we wanted to survive collectively rather than individually because it was easier. And, and now what we're doing every year is we're just, we're thinking up ideas of how to improve society to make it better, fairer, less corrupt, less oppressive. You know, we got rid of the kings and dictators so that we can have a fairer society. And we got to keep doing that because there's still inequities and there's still suffering that's created in the system. Okay, now we're getting better. That's a slightly, slightly more proper understanding of what society or what politics is really about. But can we go even higher than that? Yes, we can. So if you zoom out even higher, you can ask yourself, so what is it above, what's above that? Well, and this is where you got, <laughs> where you got to do some consciousness work and you got to have some spiritual breakthroughs. You can realize that really what politics is about, it's about elevating consciousness, the consciousness of mankind. And it's about increasing collective love. It's about helping every individual in society to be able to be more conscious and more loving. And as a result, all of that feeds into society as a whole, making it more conscious and more loving. Now that's pretty deep. See? Look at how far we've come from thinking of politics as just, you know, fighting off the evil other versus now talking about how to unite mankind in consciousness and love. This is a game changer. And look, the majority of our politicians and business people and the people who vote have no idea that this is what politics is about. The kind of news media that you watch, all the partisan tribalism you see on, on everywhere, on social media and traditional media, it doesn't give you any sense that what politics is really about is about consciousness and love. But that is what it's about. Can you see how important it is to understand that? And can you see why our politics is so fucked up? Precisely because virtually nobody understands this. Think of how profoundly this would impact your personal politics and how you participate in politics. And if you got elected, how you would govern if you came to it from the understanding that politics is all about elevating consciousness and love versus someone who got elected believing that politics is about defeating and killing 
the Republicans or the Democrats. But there's even one level higher. So what's the highest level? The highest level of what politics is really about, it's about the universe becoming ever more self-conscious, self-aware, and interconnected with itself. And that ultimately leads to infinite love. That is the, the true and proper context and frame for understanding what politics is. The problem is that to understand this highest frame, you would need to have a ridiculous awakening, a ridiculous spiritual awakening, probably multiple, to realize this. And of course, nobody has. <laughs> Hardly anybody has. And so how do you even teach this to people? See, it's not enough to take some Democrat and Republican, sit them down in a room and then tell them that, hey, you know what? Politics is all about the universe becoming self-aware and interconnected and, and, and infinite love. It's about God creating itself. That's what the universe is. I mean, that's what politics is all about. They would look at you like, a, like a, a donkey would look at you if you were trying to teach them some calculus. It can't land. They don't have the reference experiences and their, their level of cognitive development is nowhere near capable of, of understanding this and they're too selfish and too self-biased to even care about this. They'll look at you and they'll say, well, yeah, but so what? How do I feed my kids? How do I, how do I kill those Nazis? Or how do I, how do I, uh, how do I kill those progressives? That's, those are their immediate concerns because that's the level that they're at. A similar story goes for science. You might ask the question of, what is science really about? At the lowest level, you might say, science is about manipulating reality. Like, if someone is really selfish, the only reason they care about science is because science can help them to manipulate something. Like, if science can help me to build a bomb that I can throw at my enemies, great! That's the lowest level. What about a higher level? Well, you might say something like science is about measuring things. Now it's a little less selfish. <laughs> it's not about bombing somebody or what science can do for me. It's more about like, we can do measurements. We can figure out some aspects of reality. Then there's the higher level, which is science is really about understanding nature and all of its different phenomena. It's about understanding lightning and rain and volcanoes and stars and planets and humans and everything. Well, it's a little bit more profound. It's a little better perspective on what science is. You can see, that's better than just using science to manipulate and build bombs. But is there higher? You could say science is about expanding our understanding of the physical universe. Uh, you could also say science is about under, uh, expanding our understanding of life and consciousness. That's a little bit higher. Because when you think of science as just the study of the physical universe, that already is a very limited definition of science. When you include consciousness and life into it, that's a little bit deeper. That's a little bit less materialistic. And then the highest level is when you realize that science is the universe becoming conscious of itself as God and love. And that science is identical to spirituality. Science is God exploring itself. Because it's curious about itself. Because it's in love with itself. Okay. And so, um, now very few scientists see this big picture. They're somewhere lower down the ladder. Uh, but see, when you put it this way, this gives a very deep grounding for science. Uh, and many scientists sort of intuit this. Even Richard Dawkins, for example, you know, he, he talks about some of the spiritual aspects of science in the sense that, you know, you look up at the stars and you wonder. It makes you wonder. And there's this feeling of awe and reference. 
yeah, of course, but, <laughs> but do you understand why that is? Because <laughs> you're God looking at yourself. You're God experiencing its own creation. That's where the awe and wonder comes from. The awe and wonder is the awe and wonder of yourself as God, of infinite consciousness. And of course, when you love nature and you love the stars or whatever, well, what are you doing? You're loving yourself. <laughs> but of course, scientists don't understand that. So anyways, these are just two examples of the different levels and tiers of holism. And of course, this, this now apply this to any field. For example, if you're going to be making movies, you can, you can make movies from different levels of holism. If you're making video games, if you're making music, if you're writing, if you're whatever, if you're making love, you can do it at different levels of holism. All right, now let's talk about how to develop holistic thinking. So, first of all, ask higher quality questions. I've stressed this a lot in the past. I have a whole episode called The Power of Asking Questions. It's a very important episode, sort of underrated too. Go check that out. I also have other uh, episodes about contemplation, how to ask questions using journals and not. And uh, I have an episode called The 64 Most Fascinating Questions That You Could Ever Ask. Check all those out. So learning how to ask powerful questions, higher quality questions, is crucial. Uh, you can expand your holistic understanding through, or holistic thinking through psychedelics, awakening, God realization, spirituality, spiritual practice. Psychedelics are especially ridiculously powerful. Nothing will increase your holism more than psychedelics. Also, developing your intuition is important because intuition is a holistic faculty of your mind. Um, I have an episode about intuition and I'll, I'll have more episodes in the future about how to develop your intuition more. Uh, another way to develop it is don't settle for one-dimensional, linear, reductionistic, dualistic answers. A lot of times when you're asking questions in school, at work, or anyone you converse with, they'll oftentimes give you very one-dimensional, linear, reductionistic, dualistic answers. Don't be satisfied with those. Keep questioning. Keep wanting higher answers. That will push you to explore new perspectives, read books, study stuff, and then expand your holistic understanding. Uh, speaking of which, another aspect is study many perspectives. You want as many perspectives as possible because that will just e expand your holism. And also it'll expand your appreciation for diversity of perspectives. Don't get stuck in a single perspective. Also, very importantly, deconstruct the materialist and mechanical paradigm. That's straight jacketing your holistic thinking ability. Study systems thinking. Check out my episode, Intro to Systems Thinking. Also, start to consider externalities and collateral damage. That's very important. Read holistic thinkers. Spiral dynamic stage yellow and above people. People like Ken Wilber, Virchow Capra, David Bohm, Einstein, Buckminster Fuller, and many, many others. You can find many of those on my book list. And then there are still many beyond that. You can find them on YouTube and elsewhere. Step outside of your survival concerns. We've already addressed that to some degree. Another way is to study your own self-biases, which I discuss in my episode called Self-Bias, and also my other episode called Introspection. You can use introspection to do that. Develop a long time horizon. Look for top down and bottom up, and also sideways causal forces. Eliminate judging and criticizing as much as possible. Nothing will hurt your holistic thinking ability more than judging, judging and criticizing. And lastly, adopt Ken Wilber's attitude of everyone is right. Ken Wilber sort of popularized this idea. The, the, the driving force behind his work of integral theory and integrating all this understanding, he has some brilliant work, is that he sort of started off looking at the world, seeing that there's all these different people with all these different ideas and perspectives and paradigms and worldviews, religious ones, secular ones, and everything in between. And uh, how do we know who's right? And he had an intuition that told him everyone must be right. 
in partial ways, of course, in different degrees. So we're not saying that the Nazi is as right as the civil rights leader, but we're saying that there's value in every perspective, something you can learn from every perspective, and that even in a certain sense, the Nazi is right in a certain twisted way. And it's valuable for you to study what that is and how that works. And through this paradigm, you can integrate stuff together. And that is the most holistic way to approach this epistemic problem of a sort of an infinite multiplicity of, of perspectives that all disagree with each other. All right. Now, here are some questions to help you think holistically. These are very powerful questions you can ask in, in many situations, in business, in relationships, in your personal life. Write some of these down and start using them. So, firstly, how are X and Y interconnected? X and Y can be any two things. How are they interconnected? For example, how is... my consumption of food interconnected with the health of the planet? Or how is my doing my marketing interconnected with the mental health of my children? And at first, the connection might not be obvious, but as you think about it, ask this question, it'll interconnect. Another question is, what is the big picture here? This one helps you to zoom out and to see the whole rather than getting lost in the details. Another good question is, what is the larger context of this? Sometimes you hear something, you have, a teacher tells you something or you hear something in a video somewhere, like a little snippet or something, and you get so wrapped up in that you don't see the larger context. What was, what was that teacher or what is this book really trying to say? What is this statement really trying to say? See the larger context. Another question is, what is the ultimate point of all this? And by all this, I mean whatever you're working on. Like you might be in a project, sitting in a, in a meeting with a bunch of people, you guys are, have been talking for an hour, and then you stand up and say, wait a minute, guys, we're bickering back and forth, talking about all, all sorts of bunch of bullshit. What is the ultimate point of this meeting? What are we trying to do? Or you might even say, what is the ultimate point of our business? Why are we even here? This clarifies a lot of things. Another question is, why am I doing this at all? It's a great one. A lot of people don't ask this question. Like, you might be in a, in a toxic relationship, and at some point you just ask yourself, why am I doing this at all? <laughs> or you might be in some dead-end job, and you just well, ask yourself, why am I doing this at all? Or maybe your boss or your business is, is you know, manufacturing some poison pill and you might just ask yourself, why am I doing this at all? Another good question is, how is this a part of something larger? Whatever you're doing, how is it a part of something larger? And what is that larger thing? And a related question is, how does this part serve the larger whole? And you might discover that it doesn't, in which case you're in trouble. You got to change what you're doing. Also, how is this part of a duality? So you might be thinking about sexuality from the male perspective. And you get so wrapped up in that because you're male, let's say you forget the other half of the story. And then you might ask yourself, well, how is this part of a duality? And then you realize, oh yeah, women have their own reproductive concerns and so forth, and they might be different and the two interconnect somehow. And you might ask yourself further, how will this duality collapse and unite? How will this thing circle back around on itself? How will this invert? How will this boomerang? Another question to ask is, what is best for the health of the whole? What is the, what is the highest good for the whole? For example, it would be nice if some of our top CEOs asked this question more. 
Like I would, I would like to ask, I would like to have like the CEO of ExxonMobil ask this question. What is best for the health of the whole? And by whole, I don't mean his company. And by whole, I don't mean his shareholders. Another question is, how should the parts be rebalanced for the good of the whole? That's another question I want some of our business leaders to ask. Another question is, which parts are out of balance, leaching selfishly from the whole? Another question is, how is this fragmented? So enter any situation, a company, a classroom, a book that you're reading, a relationship that you're in, and you can ask yourself, how is this fragmented? And how can it be unified and healed? Another question is, how am I drawing the boundary of the system? Because you see, a lot of unholism comes from the fact that we draw our boundaries too narrowly and too selfishly to serve our own interests, leaving a lot outside the boundary of our concern. And so in any situation you go into, you can ask, you know, who is drawing the boundary? How are they drawing the boundary? Why are they drawing the boundary the way they are? And of course, the answer is that they're selfish. They're drawing the boundary to their selfish interests. But then you can ask the further question of, well, how can I redraw the boundary to expand the boundary? You can also ask, how am I involved in the situation? You can ask this of any topic. Like when it comes to the destruction of the rainforest, you can ask yourself, how am I involved in the situation? Because usually you would say, well, the rainforest, I don't live in the rainforest, so I'm not involved. Or like, how am I involved in overfishing? I don't fish for sturgeon. I don't eat caviar. So I'm not involved with the killing of the sturgeon and their extinction. But you are. In some way, you are. I guarantee it. But you have to sit down and think about it. And this question will help you to do that. Because a lot of times what the ego loves to do is to avoid responsibility for all sorts of things. And to say, well, that's not my problem. I didn't do it directly. Yeah, but the whole thing is that reality is not always direct. It's a lot of times indirect. We're not just talking about the direct here. The indirect is sometimes as important as the direct. Another question is, how would God see this situation? What would Jesus do? <laughs> In other words, how would God see this situation? So, for example, if God was uh, managing ExxonMobil, how would he manage it. But for this to work, you have to understand what God is. So let me quickly tell you uh, uh, just a, a loose idea, so at least you can start to use this question. So God's thinking about a thing is unbiased, selfless, unattached, fearless, benevolent, all-loving, all-understanding, non-judgmental, self-accepting and seeking exquisite balance for the good of all. That's the ultimate highest holism. That's what God is. That's God consciousness. So this is this is the this is the kind of thinking that led to the creation of the entire universe. That's why it works so well without a hitch. So now apply that perspective to any situation you're in. That's very powerful, extremely powerful. It's so powerful because this is the power that created the entire universe. So don't, just don't dismiss this question. And lastly, how can I better serve the greatest whole? If you just align your life with that question, you're going to ace life. Not easy to do, but anyways. So those are some of the questions for you. 
Now, uh, we're starting to get close to the, to the end. Let me wrap up here with a few warnings. So warning number one is that, remember, studying the whole in order to manipulate it for personal gain is not holism, for fuck's sake. You might say like, oh, okay, Leo taught me holism, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and study the stock market or the crypto market or the business market. I'm gonna study the hell out of it and then I'm gonna find a loophole that I can exploit and then I'm gonna get rich and that's holism. No, that's not holism. That's devilry. That's evil. See, you're exploiting a system for your personal benefit. That's everything that I don't, that I teach against, right? See, this is the problem with, with someone like Trump. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, sometimes people say Trump is a brilliant systems thinker because he can, uh, you know, he knows how to manipulate the media and he knows how to get his base riled up and voting for him. He knows how to get them activated and motivated and all of this. He's a genius. Yeah, he's a genius devil. That's what he is. But he's not thinking holistically about anything. And he's not thinking systemically. Because if you were truly holistic, you would realize that to use your understanding of holism for the purpose of manipulating the whole for your personal selfish gain is extremely unholistic <laughs> and unhealthy and toxic and cancerous and evil. That is the definition of evil. You can't separate holism from selflessness. They're utterly entangled. Now here's one more warning, which is a little tricky. Watch out, this is a trap that many of you will fall into. So far, the way that I've been presenting this holism idea is as though we have reductionism on this side and holism on this side, and that reductionism is bad, holism is good, so adopt holism, throw away reductionism, judge it and condemn it, and now just be holistic and only think about holes and that's it. This is holism as the polar opposite of reductionism. If you think this way, you're actually not being truly holistic because there's really two versions of holism. See if you can grasp this. It's a little bit subtle, but also it's pretty easy to understand. So, let's define the following distinction. Make this distinction in your mind. There is holism with a lowercase h, and there's holism with an uppercase h. What's the difference? The difference is that the little h holism is the polar opposite of reductionism, creating a new duality, which of course is unholistic. So it's when you it's when you act and try to be holistic, but you're still not fully holistic because you have created a duality between you and reductionism. You haven't really, you've drawn your boundary that still excludes some stuff. Whereas true holism with, you know, absolute holism with an ab capital H, we'll call that absolute holism. Absolute holism is so holistic that it even incorporates reductionism into it and it incorporates and integrates the unholistic people and things that's going on everywhere. So when you're operating under the lowercase h holism, you will see unholistic people everywhere and you will judge them and demonize them and criticize them and hate them. And that's not very holistic. If you're practicing uppercase h absolute holism, you will see all those and you realize, ah, those are just people with low consciousness who don't know any better. They haven't learned about holism and maybe some of them can be redeemed. And in the end, all those people are just action, aspects of myself, God as the whole universe, and all of it is just love. And when you take that approach, can you see that that is the highest holism? Your holism is so high that it even integrates evil.
the lowercase h holism still thinks that there is a good, which is holism, and then there is a bad, which is the opposite of holism. But that's, can you see how that's limited? If your goal was to truly be holistic, actually, not as an ideology or anything like that, you would have to incorporate all of the evil and all the stuff you don't like and all the unholistic stuff. You can't just say, well, I'm going to be holistic and fuck everybody else. They can do whatever they want. And if they're unholistic, then they're bad and they're wrong and they're evil. If you say that, you're not truly being holistic. So be careful making that mistake. Being holistic in an absolute sense is one of the most difficult things you can do because you can see how threatening it is to the ego. You have to surrender so much to be able to accept all that evil and all that lack of holism in the world. Because you know what? When you, just because you decide to be holistic does not mean people are going to start to be nice to you. You might be holistic, but people will try to rob you, scam you, hurt you, attack you, maybe even kill you, enslave you, exploit you. And you have to be so holistic that you realize, oh yeah, all of that is just an aspect of myself, of the universe. It's just a, different manifestations of love at various densities. And if you could do that, then you would truly be holistic. Can you see? Now, the ultimate form of holism isn't thinking at all. We've been talking about thinking here a lot, but there's only so far you can go with thinking. The ultimate form of holism is pure, infinite consciousness. Holism is actually a function of consciousness. Your state of consciousness determines how holistic you are more than anything that you think. It's still important to increase your thinking ability, but uh, once you've done that and you're ready for more, then you got to go <laughs> trans thinking, trans rational. You cannot think your way to the highest holism, which is why maybe some of the stuff I'm saying here sounds kind of kooky, new agey, and not rational, or maybe it doesn't make practical sense to you. Like when I tell you that all the you know evil people are out there who are exploiting you, that they are just expressions of love, you probably don't, many of you probably don't uh, understand why I say that. Well, that's because to understand that, you have to go beyond just thinking about it to actual infinite consciousness, change your state. So the changing of your state of consciousness is actually the highest lever you can pull to become more holistic, which is why I said psychedelics are one of the best ways to do it because psychedelics are the most effective way, hands down, of radically altering your state of consciousness. But there are other ways. It's not just psychedelics. But yeah, that, that's one of the most remarkable things about, about psychedelics is just how holistic they feel when you take them, right? I mean, if you've taken psychedelics, you know what I'm talking about. It feels so holistic. Even if you've just done them recreationally, you, like you took some MDMA at a, at a nightclub, at a rave, at a music festival, um, maybe you didn't really realize much, but probably the one thing you did realize is, uh, is the holism of it all. That's very powerful. Keep doing more of that. Although I don't recommend doing a lot of MDMA. It's not very healthy for you. There's healthier psychedelics. So in conclusion, a fragmented mind creates a fragmented world to heal the world. We must unify our minds. If we don't unify our minds, there's no way the world can heal. I hope that's obvious to you. And then the only question is, do you want to heal the world? Do you want to take responsibility for that? Or are you just going to say, ah, that's not my problem. I don't care. Every problem has both holistic and unholistic solutions. So here you have to be careful because a lot of times you face a problem in your life personally or collectively and you're looking for a solution. But sometimes you're so desperate 
You just want a solution, you'll take any solution. And you'll forget that there are different kinds of solutions. There's not just one solution. There are unholistic solutions and holistic solutions. And so you have to be very careful here not to get suckered into unholistic solutions. Uh, for example, if you're broke and you got to pay your bills, an unholistic solution might be to go, to go rob a bank. Or another unholistic solution might be to go, you know, take a course on Wall Street day trading and become a Wall Street day trader. And to think that, well, oh, this will solve my problems. No, you're just kicking the can down the road. Your problems will keep multiplying. Chances are you'll lose all your money anyways, whatever little you have left, and you'll be even broker than you are right now. That's the reality of unholistic solutions. Or maybe you're feeling uh, heartbroken after a intimate relationship collapsed of yours. So you go, you know, you're looking for a solution to your misery and you go and you shoot up some heroin. Well, that would be a very unholistic solution. A holistic solution, for example, in the case of, you know, if you're broke, you might get serious about starting a business and you might start researching that. Not a get-rich-quick scheme, but a serious actual business where you generate value and work hard at it. That would be a holistic solution. If you're feeling bad after a, you know, a big breakup, rather than splurging on a bucket of ice cream or some heroin, you, uh, a more holistic solution might be something like you take a week off, you do a solo retreat, maybe treat yourself a little bit, maybe, maybe you can even afford to buy a plane ticket to Hawaii, just go there and just kind of bask in your misery while you're walking around the beach and looking at, at beautiful stuff and just, you know, contemplate why your relationship went wrong and what you're going to do next time and, and just kind of make it a little bit meditative like that. That might be a holistic way to, to go about that. And what you should know is that if you encounter a problem in your life that you feel is impossible to solve, most likely it's because, simply because your approach to that problem was not holistic enough. And this is a beautiful thing if you realize this, because this gives can give you so much optimism and hope in your life. Like if you have a health problem, if you have a business problem, if you have a financial problem, if you have a drug addiction problem, alcohol problem, overeating problem, uh, problem getting laid, getting a date, a problem meditating. A problem with the depression or your emotions, a problem with your insecurity and low self-esteem. And you've been trying to solve that problem. The problem is that you've been trying to solve it within a certain narrow paradigm. An unholistic approach you've been taking. So if you really want to solve that problem, you got to ask yourself sort of a meta question here is like, hmm, you know, God damn it. I've been trying to build this business for the last five years. I keep failing and failing and failing. I'm still stuck in wage slavery. I don't know what to do. Is it just the universe? Is my, am, am I cursed? Is this, is this just, uh, am I, is this just how it's supposed to be? No. Ask the meta question. How is my thinking not sufficiently holistic enough to crack this problem? That's powerful. And then you might realize something like, wait a minute. Yeah, I've been trying to work hard at this business, but I've been working hard, but I didn't study how business works enough. Maybe I got to go buy books. Or maybe what I really need, you know, I read a bunch of books already and they didn't work. Maybe what I really need is I need to find a mentor face to face. He can point out my problems to me. So maybe you go find a mentor. Or maybe you say uh, like... Um, the reason my business wasn't working was because the business I was working on, I wasn't fully passionate about. I didn't care about it as much. Therefore, I wasn't motivated enough. And then maybe you go take my life purpose course and then you find your life purpose. And then maybe that helps you, whatever, whatever. 
Or maybe, you know, I've been trying to build this business, but I was too focused on building the product, but I wasn't focused enough on marketing. Maybe I gotta go study marketing. So you go study marketing. And that will be the key that unlocks that, that problem. Very powerful. So, can you see that division, fragmentation, and reductionism is not bad? It's only bad in the relative sense. Because if you're truly holistic, nothing is bad. Everything is good. And everything you think is bad is just a bias that you have that you need to let go of. See, good is equivalent to holism. So if you want the highest good, seek the highest holism. And you'll find it. And lastly, just remember this. He or she who is most holistic wins the game of life. All right, that's it. I'm done here. <laughs> I'm very exhausted. Um, that was challenging to do because I, I feel lightheaded from this fast. But anyways, we got through it. So there's proof for you that the brain can even work when, it, when it's running low on glucose. And I think this, this episode is actually pretty good. Maybe even one of my clearer ones. In a certain sense, I have, I have very good mental clarity and I'm very calm and grounded from this fast. But also, like I feel very weak and lethargic and just like almost like I'm, I'm about to faint at any moment. <laughs> so it's this very odd place to be. Um, and it's not particularly pleasant. I'm looking forward to get some food in another week. But okay, this is it. I'm done here. Please click that like button for me. Come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find my blog with a bunch of videos. I will post about my fast on the blog soon. You can check that out. It'll be a valuable video for many of you. Um, actually quite important. Uh, I post, I post a lot of important stuff on my blog, exclusive stuff. You can only find it there. It's free. I don't charge you anything for it. I could, I could charge you hundreds of dollars for it. I put it out for free. So don't be stupid and don't ignore that. And what else is there? <laughs> the book list, the life purpose course, the forum, come ask questions on the forum. I answer so much stuff on the forum. Um, other people there answer and provide good, good answers as well. Participate, uh, join a community that helps you to stick with this actualization journey. And, um, the last thing is that I have a book re recommendation for you, but it's only for those of you who, who have purchased the book list. So if you purchase the book list, which is very cheap and affordable, um, go into the book list and look for a book, use the search function, control F, Search for David Bohm. On that book list, I think I have two books by David Bohm. One of them is called Implicate Order. Not that one. There's another one. Find that one and read it and study it deeply because it's all about this problem of a lack of holistic thinking and why holistic thinking is so important. Read that book. It, it's a it's a killer book in combination with this entire holistic thinking episode. And if you haven't bought my book list and you haven't started reading the books on my book list, you're really missing out. And in fact, this is what I'll end on is that, look, my videos are pretty deep and long and it makes you think that, oh, well, I've watched so many of Leo's deep videos and long videos that surely this is enough theory. Surely I don't need to read any books. You do. And I don't care how many other YouTubers you watch or how many podcasts you listen to. None of that is a substitute for reading books. There's something you get from books that you can't get from any audio or visual source. You must read these books. There's detail in there that will interconnect many of the concepts. And really, my videos are just half of the equation. The other half of the equation is to read all the books on my book list. So to really start to do this self-actualizing stuff, this business, seriously, 
you got to watch a lot of my videos. You also got to watch a lot of other videos that are not mine. That are talking about other stuff that I don't talk about. And you got to read at least 100 books. At least 100 books. Make the goal over the next five years to read 100 books from my book list. This is one of the best things you'll ever do in your life. It's one of the best investments in your life. It's not expensive. It'll cost you virtually nothing other than your time and effort. Yes, it will take a bit of time. Quite a bit of time. But, um, but man, this is going to, this is going to, help you understand so much stuff. There's just, there's just so much detail to these topics that we're talking about that you can't, I can't possibly deliver it all to you as much as I try, even through these long ass two, three hour videos and these multiple episode series. It just can't happen. So go read the fucking books and then stay tuned for more.